I will uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, I'll begin by uh, acknowledging we are in Treaty 1 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. My name is Neil Harden. I'm chairing today's panel. With me is Laurie Davidson to my left and Brent McIntyre to my far left. Uh, the assessor today is Arif Das Muhammad, and the reporting secretary is Michelle Neaton. Um, we will be hearing applications for a revision of the assessment rule in accordance with the Municipal Assessment Act. The matters for which revision is requested have been described in each application and will limit discussion to those matters. The statements that the applicants of the assessor make at this hearing are sworn testimony and anyone speaking to the matters must be sworn in. We advise that comparisons of assessments of properties are not considered evidence of market value by the board. The board is appointed annually by the council and is independent of it in the city administration. It makes its decisions on the basis of the evidence provided at this hearing and issues a written order that will be mailed to all parties as soon as possible. Please note that the board's decisions with respect to an application may be appealed to the Manitoba Municipal Board if the matter pertains to assessed value or classification for the Court of Queen's Bench if the matter pertains to the application of exemptions from taxation. Should you wish to appeal information on how to do so will be included with the board's order. With respect to the hearing process, I will confirm the matters to be addressed with each applicant following the swearing in. We will then have the assessor's testimony followed by questions the applicant may have and then the applicant's testimony followed by questions. Each side will have an opportunity to summarize if they wish. Once all the evidence about an application has been brought forward, the applicant may leave. The process will repeat for each item on the docket today. The session will close after all the applications have been heard and the board will deliberate in private and make its decisions. You will receive the order by registered mail as soon as possible. Uh, as uh, uh, information, all public hearings are usually live streamed, recorded, and would be part of the public record. I don't think we're live streaming. We're not live streaming. Okay, um, can you swear in the assessor? Uh, are you expecting the uh, applicant from uh, 52 Elder? I have not heard if they're coming or not. They need to pick up the brief. They need to pick up the brief. Well, we'll hold that one over to the last uh, one. Okay. So the first property will be 405 Logan. Can you take one of them? File number 19-4621, roll number 130-960-58300, address is 405 Logan Avenue, the roll year is 2020, the reference date is April 1st, 2018, and the assessed value is 2.424 million. Uh, so it's industrial warehouse, number of buildings is two, number of premises is one, number of stories is one. Uh, the actual year built it is between 1964 and 1999. The effective year is the same between 1969 and 1999. However, we're using the effective year built of 1969. Uh, the zoning is manufacturing, uh, sorry, the zoning is M2 manufacturing light. And uh, uh, general, so F, so it's zone one and two, so M1 and two, M2, and M2 is general and M1 is light. Uh, the land area is 101,334 square feet. Plan area is 44,052 square feet. Gross floor area is 45,820 square feet. Same with the leasable area, 45,820 square feet. The land to plan area is 2.321. Uh, on the following page, uh, we'll see there is a subject uh, sale history. So on October 20th, 2009, 
the subject sold for 1.2 million. Uh, on March 5th, 2012, the subject sold again for 1.8 million. Uh, the 2012 sale was six years prior to the reference date. Uh, according to the sales questionnaire, uh, according to the sales questionnaire from 2012, uh, the sale was a cash down payment of 600,000 and the remaining 67% of 1.2 million was a forced mortgage by Crosstown Credit Union. Uh, following section subject property leases, if we turn to page 11 for the income expense rule. So on 11 is the uh, income statement. Uh, we see that uh, they are including interest payment in the expenses, which is not allowed for uh, calculating NOI. On the following page, we see that the rent uh, is uh, $18,518.92 per month, which works out to about $4.83 net. And if you look on the rent roll again, uh, you see the rent is a step, a step up lease. So uh, apparently the sale from 2012 was between related parties, uh, I think they're brother-in-laws. Um, but you can see the rent of $4.82 per feet net is considered favorable. And I think that's why it is because of that. Uh, that they are related. Uh, on the following page, I have my rent comparables. Uh, the two properties at uh, Comp 1 and Comp 3, if you could just strike those out, I'm not sure what I was thinking when I was using those. Uh, those are not uh, comparable and we're not relying on them. Uh, so all, uh, besides those, all leases are current in relation to the reference date. All comparables are storage warehouses which allow for light manufacturing. Effective ages range from 1955 to 1989. The wall heights range from 12 feet to 26 feet. These wall areas range from approximately 30,000 square feet to 44,000 square feet. And the net rents range from $3.95 per square feet to $8.49 per square feet. If you turn to the following page, we're using a, uh, our, in our income workup, we're using an overall market net rent of $5.01. Uh, we're allowing for 6% vacancy loss. We're allowing for 2% uh, shortfall, uh, or sorry, 2% uh, non recoverable expenses. We're allowing a vacancy shortfall of $3.75. We're also allowing a pretty high cap rate uh, of 8.3. So if you work that out, the net operating income comes out to 201159 with the 8.3% cap rate, that gives us a capital asset value of 2.423 million. Uh, and that's what we are, uh, we're assessing the value of the property at 2.424 million. So if we go to page eight, you we'll see a map of the subject property. Below that is the subject parcel boundaries. It's a pretty large, uh, property, you can see it takes up all of that block there. Uh, on the following page, there's some overhead pictures, the front and the back. And then on page 10, we have some uh, street views of the subject property. So going back to page four, uh, taking into consideration the most recent sale, which was six years prior to the reference date and the income that the property generates, we believe that the assessed value of 2.42 million is uh, fair and equitable, and we respectfully ask the board to confirm that value. And I'm open to questions. Any questions, Mr. Swan? Good morning, Mr. Swan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just have a few questions. I guess I'll start with page three of your reference. Okay. With the uh, market rents. So there's a list of nine comparisons here, I guess, are supporting the market rent applied. Right. Um, the bottom six, so four to nine, those are all located in Inkster Park, correct? Right. right uh, getting properties with this size of leasable areas is hard to find. 
And just to confirm, the subject is located in the core area, Logan, Henry, Ellen, those are the streets. Yes. How do you feel that compares as a location to Inkster Park? I think the, they are similar because the, uh, the Inkster is in market region one and this is in market region six, so I think it's on the boundary maybe even. So you feel they're comparable? I do. Yeah. Um, the two comparisons that you show near the top, numbers one and three, those are both located right in the subject's location, correct? Uh, yes, but I think they are not zoned properly uh, for that, uh, yeah. But these are arm's length rents that are being paid for those premises? Uh, I didn't rely on them, so I'm not sure. Okay. You'd agree that they're considerably less so than the rent shown? They are, yes, yeah. Okay. But like I said, I didn't rely on them. The last comparison you show here, 78 Hutchings, and it has a considerably higher rent, 849. Uh, are you aware that the marketing materials for this premise uh, noted that it's prime warehouse manufacturing in Winnipeg's largest industrial park and that the office showroom production spaces, high capacity electrical service are all fully renovated in 2012 and has high quality office space and rail access. Did you feel that this is a comparable property? So uh, the reason I use this comparable is just to show the ranges of uh, the, the rents that are being collected on that size of property. But uh, if you look at the other uh, uh, comparables, they are well within the range of what we are using. Okay, so, so it's, it's part of the range, I guess. Right. It's a higher end, you have lower end. Right. The average of all your comparisons is just over $5 a square foot? I would, yes. yes. And you mentioned the actual lease in place as of the reference date is four dollars and eighty-five cents a square foot. Correct. Thank you. And I believe that might be because the uh, uh, landlord and the tenant are related. Do you have any evidence of that? I uh, guess the uh, income, uh, or sorry, the sales mailer from twenty twelve <coughs> indicated that they were uh, not our site. And that is in evidence here. I don't have an evidence. I'm just speaking to it. It was from twenty twelve. Okay, because that's contrary to what I understand. But, uh, the, um, the last question is regarding the expense allowance. So historically, the city of Winnipeg has allowed uh, a total of 7% of the effective gross income, uh, which was comprised of, I guess, 2% for structural reserve capital improvements. No, 2% for uh, non-recoverables and 5% for management. And we're not using management. Uh, we're not allowing management anymore because our market data indicates that uh, mar uh, uh, management expenses are covered. So the, the position that you have today is that the 5% historically for the last 25 years of the uh, assessment practice <coughs> has been for a recoverable expense uh, management fee. Correct. And that was an error for all that time and it's been corrected. What the market shows now is that management fees are being collected. And I think uh, the board has heard uh, many hearings with our evidence presented. Yeah, that's so I'm not going to. So just to confirm that the 2% is to account for all capital improvements over the life no, of the capital. No, uh, capital expenses are capitalized. So the 2% is not recoverable expenses. Is there any structural reserve included in the 2%? No. There's no structural reserve no. included in the 2% yeah. When We've never had structural reserve. So any capital improvements over the life of the property are not <coughs> amortized into your income stream as you present? No, uh, they're capitalized by the owner over a period of time. And they're not, okay. Uh, that's all the questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Laurie, do you have any questions? Um, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, in terms of the, your word copy, is it all coming from the model? It is model. Uh, no adjustments for anything? Uh, well, I mean, we're using overall a uh, high cap rate. Uh, if you look at our page uh, 6 for our cap rate study, uh, it is outside the 80th percentile, so we're... Uh, we're Putting the 8.3 percent because of the location. Okay. So they were the rent comparables selected by you, or the model generally? Uh, the, the comps were uh, selected by us. Okay. And then I just had um, um, a bit of a follow-up question to the previous discussion on the rent comps. So they differ by location clearly, mm -hmm. and I can see the average wall height, and you know those things are a little bit different. Are they all kind of the same though in terms of what they could be used for or the condition? Yes, they're all zoned uh, comparable to the subject. Uh, these are all zoned M2. Okay. And they're all similar condition as far as you know? As far as I know, yes. 
All right. Thank you very much. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple. Sure. On page 3, 1,000 Henry, is that not, it appears twice <coughs> in your rent comparison. Pardon? 1,000 Henry Avenue? Yes. It appears twice in your rent comparison. Yes. Uh, there's two spaces in there. Uh, but, like I said, I'm not uh, relying on the Henry box. Yeah, no, I was just concerned whether it was a... One no, I uh, have two premises in Okay. Um, on the rent roll, page 12. So that's a 12 year lease? Yes. Beginning in 2012, ending in 2024. Right, and uh, according to the sales mailer, uh, uh, in 2012, there was a note in there saying that uh, the apparently uh, he signed a, a large lease because he was in need of money, so his brother-in-law came and bought the subject, and he signed a long-term lease because of that. I, I didn't put it into evidence. Uh, I should have. Uh, well. so, the, so the net rent in 2012 was 483 Uh Yes. And it's a step-up lease? Right, yes. So you have, do you have any information on what the rent, net rent is? Is it the reference? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, this is at, uh, as of 2017, uh, December 31st. But I don't know what it was at the reference. Okay. That's all my questions. Okay, and I have a question on your page 11 there. I don't know if you can clarify under the income. It says, got checked fully owner occupied. I'm not sure why they would have checked that. Uh, it is in at least, uh, and the sales mailer indicated that uh, another company owns that building now, which so is owned by the brother. I guess. Okay, so they're related, but they're, they're, it's they're, not It's not owned by Okay. Thank you. And proceed. Thank you, sir. Uh, if I may direct you to the direct evidence that you provided, or five more. There's a photograph of the property on page two and the overhead map on page three. And the assessor has gone through the property description quite well, but what we have is a um, in the core area on a, a relatively small site, the land building ratio is just over two to one. It was a 1964 vintage warehouse that had an addition in 1999. It's very spartan in finish. It has a very small office area in the mezzanine. It has minimal loading at the back onto Henry. The property was sold in a leaseback transaction in March 2012 for $1.8 million. Uh, and the lease that's being discussed is the uh, result of that transaction. From my understanding, it's an arm's length lease. Um, the two parties uh, act separately. They feel that the, the sale price and the rent were at market. Uh, whenever I hear that kind of statement, we like to test it for ourselves, though, which I'll do in a moment by looking at the market evidence. So in 2012, uh, lease back transaction for $1.8 million, the lease was set up. The lease originally was at $4 a square foot, and it had step-ups. The last step-up was in 2014, it stepped to four eighty three dollars a square foot. This lease extends to 2024. It's not a uh, temporary situation. It's a long-term lease. Uh, as of the reference date, the lease is still at the step-up rate of four eighty three dollars a square foot. Now, if I may ask you to turn to page 7. We now know what the actual lease is in place. From our understanding, it was uh, at market between the two parties, although it was the subject of lease transaction. When we hear those kind of terms, we like to test. We don't take it at face value. Uh, but we do understand that that's the lease that somebody would be purchasing if they purchased the property as of April 18. So on page 7, we look at 11 different comparisons. And they're, uh, as the assessor had done, we're trying to look at similar size and types of properties. Uh, but we feel that some of the assessment comparisons may be superior when we take a look at the type of finish that we have in the subject property, the location, the land building ratio, factors like that. So we looked at these 11. Uh, for the board's reference, I have photographs of each one starting on page 12. And they're all, in our opinion, very good comparisons to the subject property. I'll just quickly go through some of the uh, pertinent points on each one. 
Index 1 is located on St. James Street, so a superior location, standalone industrial property, just north of Saskatchewan Avenue. And according to the uh, business assessment records, the finished area is just under 10%. A good comparison all around. Um, the larger land building ratio, better location, so we would imagine that all in all, the subject property would be commanding less than this rent of $5.68 a square foot. Index 2 is actually a unit within a larger property at 170 Furniture Park. Uh, so we don't consider it a, best, a very great comparison, but it is something that tells us what this size of space with an age of 1981 uh, and similar ceiling height and land building ratios might command, and that would be 350 a square foot in this case. So from the first two, we're imagining to be somewhere in between, and so far our test of the actual rent in place to market is definitely passing. Index 3 is located on Owens Creek, which is uh, just north of the north and west of the St. James location. So again, I consider it a superior location than the subject's core location. It has a higher ceiling height of 28 feet. It has a similar land building ratio. Um, and it commands $5 a square foot. Index 4 is located on Key Wayton, just south of Inkster Park. Higher ceiling height of 26 feet. And it commands 549 a square foot. Number five is in the St. James Industrial Location, slightly larger at 63,000 square feet and a 16-foot wall height, and it commands 422 a square foot, an upward adjustment in our minds would be required. Index six is in the St. Boniface Industrial Park, 21-foot wall height, 1978 built, similar land to building ratio. It commands 394 a square foot. Number seven is uh, located on Desmirons, and I think this isn't St. Boniface, but it's, it's I think a more interesting comparison because it's not located in either a high uh, traffic industrial commercial location like St. James, nor is it located in a designated industrial park, which I consider superior, like Easter Park. This is located off of uh, uh, on Desmirons and St. Boniface, and it commands 393 a square foot for smaller space, 21,000 feet, and a 24 foot wall. Height. Index 8 is also smaller at 24,000 feet, again on Border Street. It commands 475 a square foot. Otherwise, very good comparison. Number 10, or sorry, 9, 10, and 11 are all multi tenant industrial units, so I put less weight on those, but to give an idea for similar, or for smaller spaces, they're commanding uh, between 405 and 475 a square foot. So, all said, Mr. Chairman, I think we've done a pretty good swath of the market. We're trying to recognize all factors location, land building ratio, age, finish, uh, ceiling height. And in the end, the market rent, or sorry, the actual rent in place of 45 passes our test to be deemed at market, especially considering the, uh, the location. Essentially, that's our only contention. We feel that the vacancy allowance applied is reflective of the area as to the capitalization rate. So we have no contention with those areas. Uh, the shortfall rate is approximately what the actual expenses paid are, so we have no contention there. The last contentious item has to do with the uh, non-recovered expense allowance. Now, just again as background, and I think we, I think everybody on the panel has been through this many times, but I'll just give kind of the Coles notes of our position as um, discussed in the second document that we've provided. So, essentially, the, the number one concern that we have is that we all know that this was uh, an allowance totaling seven percent since the beginning of the income approach being used for market value by the city. And it was comprised of two uh, allowances, one being 5% for what was called the management non-recovered allowance, and the second was 2% for what was called other, that included structural reserve. So the, the point is, imagine yourself purchasing a property, and you're trying to get into the minds of an investor. Anytime an investor is looking at uh, a property like this, whether it be income producing or owner occupied, they go through an analysis by an income approach of what the potential rent is, and they make allowances. One is for the vacancy, and one is for what they imagine to be the expenses over the life of the property. So it's an amortized allowance for such items as roof repairs, parking lot repairs, capital improvements that basically can't be recovered from the tenants. They're not typically allowed to be recovered from the tenants. In addition to that are all non-recovered expenses, expenses that can't be recovered from the tenants, for any other expenses to do with the uh, sustainability of the income that they're applying. 
Anytime uh, a property is leased, there are considerable costs for leasing commissions. There's often a considerable amount of tenant inducement that the landlord has to pay. And over the life of the property, these will be incurred a number of times. And so what the practice has been, and historically, is to have an allowance of 5% for that item, in addition to the 2%. This is what investors actually do in the market. They'll make this deduction because they estimate over their holding period, over the life of the building, these expenses will be real. Uh, if I could draw your attention to page four of the second document, I think this is a very important point. And it kind of speaks to, I think, what seems to be a bit of the uh, disagreement on this item. Uh, because uh, I would suggest strongly that this was never considered to be reflective of management fees. If I may quote, this is from an appraisal text from the University of British Columbia. Halfway down page four, you'll see an item that's called operating costs and property taxes in brackets recoverable expenses. So what this is, is talking about all expenses that should be considered in your valuation, but typically are recovered from the tenant. So on a net lease basis, we don't really have to worry about them, except in the shortfall allowance. And these expenses are very clear to include payroll, cleaning, utilities, maintenance, repairs, grounds and parking area, maintenance, not replacement, and management fees and insurance. Taxes is another one. So management fees already is already put into the box of recoverable expenses. And that's, that's known. I mean, this is something that anyone who had looked at leases over the last 25 years would know. These are typically recovered. Government tenants are a little different. Uh, but what you have in that case is a semi-gross rent. Now, the second item is leasing and capital costs. These are called non-recovered expenses. This is exactly what the previous 7% and now reduced to 2% allowance is reflected. The appraiser should also account for non-recoverable expenses, also called, called non-rechargeable expenses. The most important non-recoverable cost items to be aware of are space marketing costs, which include both tenant inducements and leasing costs, and an allowance for structural or mechanical repairs. So this comes back to my original point. The 7% reduced to 2 is simply, in our opinion, and based on the findings of the study, not sufficient when you count all of the items that would be included in that amount. So they're real expenses. Appraisal theory directs us to consider them. It had been recognized in the City of Winnipeg up to the 2020 cycle. And if we look to the assessment practices of provinces surrounding Manitoba, both Saskatchewan and Ontario, we will see language in their model that tells us exactly what Winnipeg had been doing previously, which is allowing both the 5 and the 2%. On page 5, um, we have uh, uh, excerpts from the Saskatchewan Valuation Guide, and you'll see in the middle, I'll just hit on a couple of the main points, but this is very consistent with what was in the assessment guide for, for Winnipeg up to 2020. Non-recoverable operating expenses are expenses which are not passed on to the tenants. And then if we go on to page six, we see that these non-recoverable operating expenses include legal and audit fees, structural repairs, that in our mind was the 2%, advertising and promotion, and leasing commissions. So it's a whole swath of items that they allow 7% for. Ontario is very similar language in the model on page 7. Uh, and they say basically the same thing, that you have to count for all of these items when you're doing an income approach. And again, their allowance is much higher than the 2%. Uh, further in the study, for we, we haven't really touched upon this, or I haven't in the last while, but what we did is an analysis on page 10 of a whole assortment of properties. And we tried to find out over a three-year period, what are, the, what are these expenses looking like? And they have quite a range. It can be as low as 2.77%. Uh, or sorry, I, I'd like to direct your attention to the furthest column, because this is all of the items discussed. It ranges from uh, a low of maybe 2.96%, up to, in, in one case for Mountain Avenue, 54%. But the whole point of this allowance is that we don't take the mass deduction in any given year of all the costs that be incurred. It's an amortized amount over the life of the property. So when we look at the averages at the bottom, the median, including tenant inducements, 7.35%. Tenant inducements are a very contentious item. We think they are real and they should be considered. But even if we take those out, our averages, or sorry, our median is 5.75%. This sample study of 32 properties includes single-tenant buildings, just to be clear. 
They may not uh, always be as high as the multi-tenant, but they do have, over the life of the property, similar types of expenses. So based on market behavior, appraisal theory, practices by other assessment jurisdictions, including Winnipeg itself up to 2020, and our own study, 2% is not sufficient for this allowance, and we strongly suggest that the board consider reinstating the original 7% total, which was 5 plus 2. Uh, I think I'll stop there on, on that subject. And then if we could please direct back to the uh, original document on page 9, we then summarize our open valuation. Again, based on our test of the actual rent, uh, we feel it is at market or reflective of market, and we apply that as the potential market income. We've deducted the 6% vacancy allowance, the market shortfall rate of 375 a square foot, the total 7% for non-recovered expenses, and we capitalize the net operating income at 8.3% as applied by the city for a total value of 2216000 Again, that is an escalation from what the uh, leaseback transaction was at $1.8 million. I think that, Mr. Chairman, concludes our presentation. Again, in the appendix, we have photographs of all of the properties, for the board's reference, and we have similar documentation surrounding the assessment as the, the assessor has in his uh, documents. So that completes our presentation. I thank you very much. Questions? Uh, yes. Uh, on your page seven of your brief, yes. Uh, so you are saying that actual rent is four eighty five. Right. Uh, your comparables. Uh, I was looking for the index. I, there's no addresses, uh, so I, I cannot verify these rent rates. Is, why are there no addresses? Uh, we don't put those in for uh, reasons of privacy because we pull them from our, our central. So how am I supposed to verify that these are the correct? Because in the past. I know there has been several mistakes where the rents that are indicated are not the actual rents. Yes. Um, what we typically do is, if the uh, city wants to know any information in advance, we'll gladly provide them the addresses. Well, just can't have what evidence is for? Uh, exchanging evidence is not what that's for? Yes, and that's what the rebuttal period is for. So you exchange the evidence three weeks in advance so that there's a chance to investigate. Right, so I'm just wondering, there's never any addresses here, and I know some of these rents are not correct in here uh, from previous uh, uh, briefs that have been handed in by Baltus. Okay, uh, I, I would um, uh, welcome the rebuttal evidence on that, Mr. Professor. Well, if I had addresses, I could rebut them, right? So um, how do you know that they're wrong? Some of them I know from previous that were wrong, like some, some on the nine, for example. Uh, I know that one for sure is not at uh, 394. Uh, usually you guys are off by a dollar, but I'm just wondering, there's never any oh, that, I, I'm sorry, that yes. is a very... Well, I, why did you not put you uh, have indexes uh, here? Our office is being accused of uh, doctoring information? Right. Is that being allowed? Said that. He said they're off by a dollar. Off by a dollar. Often off by a dollar. We go through our evidence and we, we are very careful about our data. I take great offense to somebody accusing us of doctoring data. Well, I don't think you're accusing you doctor. I'm not accusing. I'm just saying there's been many times where the uh, actual rents that you present are not actual rents. Okay, well, uh, I, I disagree. Nine, but, uh, but again, you're going to wait. I mean, unless we can see evidence. Well, we I'm just saying there's no addresses provided, so I can't even do my due diligence on the evidence that's provided. Uh, Mr. Assessor, again, uh, in the future, we're welcome. We would gladly provide the addresses to you. We just don't want them on the public record. I, you have my it. brief with all the addresses in there, and you can verify all my information, right? Uh, just wondering why you wouldn't provide the same courtesy. Yeah, I was wondering. Your, yeah. So on your page 9, you're using actual rents of 485 then, uh, but you're using a, a market vacancy of 6%, and meanwhile the subject is, uh, has a long-term lease of 12 years, you said? Uh, another 12 years remaining. Right, so why don't you use a vacancy rate then? Uh, well, because it's a, a vacancy allowance is standard appraisal practice. It's over the life of the property. But you want to use rates. actual market or actual rents and then use market. So I, it's either one or the other. So well, I'm no, not sure. I, I, I went through great care in my presentation to say that we tested the actual rent to determine if it was at market. But on your comps, that doesn't even match your market rent there. You have an uh, average of $4.43. 
And then here's 485, which I assume to be his actual. Yes. Yeah. We're testing to see if the actual makes so sense. How, where is your test showing that that's the actual then? Well, I went, the through, I went through 11 different comparisons and I made adjustments, uh, qualified adjustments to determine if the market rent, or sorry, the actual rent was indicative of market, and we felt it was fine. Right. Um, I have no further question. I, if I can just speak to the, uh, the, the coverable uh, study that they did. Uh, you want, then you can present rebuttal on that. Yeah, I, I just a couple of points. Uh, so the 5% historical management fee, management fee was, in fact, an expense relating to standard management fees charged by the owner. Uh, the expenses that Altus determined as non-recoverable, recoverable, such as leasing costs, tenant inducements, free rent, are contrary to assessment case, in, uh, case law in Manitoba. Uh, the capitalized costs that you, uh, the, uh, uh, your study uh, ref uh, mentions, those are non-recoverables and are typically utilized during discount cash flow methods. Uh, and the asset management fees, I think I saw in your uh, uh, study also, those are not, uh, uh, asset management fees are for portfolio properties, where you have a number of properties and a week, for example, is managing these properties. Those are asset management fees. Those are not uh, management expense fees, so those are not included either. That's all. Is, is that uh, directed to this question, or should I answer that? Yeah, in, uh, some rebuttal evidence. So okay. can, yeah. yeah, if I may, I'd like to address uh, each of those items. Um, number one, the city is claiming a jurisdictional exception, I believe, that uh, certain items should not be included in the expense allowance. And again, we disagree. Those decisions, and we have copies of the original two, each of the decisions, I think there's six or seven of them at the municipal board, and what is being asked of the municipal board in each case by the owner's agent is that a lump sum amount for the leasing commissions and the tenant inducements uh, that generated the rent in place. So imagine you have a rent of 485 a square foot and it costs the owner a total of, let's say, uh, $1.50 a square foot in all these costs. They were saying, can we take the $1.50 off the 485? And I agree with the board, that's not appropriate because the point of this allowance is to be an amortized amount over the life of the property, not to deduct lump sum amounts from a face rent to come up with a net effective. So in each of the decisions, what they say is the board has uh, contemplated this request before and we refer you back to our decision, uh, two decisions, one being the Richardson Building in 1994 and the second being uh, National Trust Building, Triple Four St. Mary in 1997. The Richardson building decision uh, didn't actually contemplate it at all. What happened is the owner's agent said, we want this big lump sum deduction. And keep in mind at the time, the assessment manual, which would have guided the city in applying 7% allowance, stated that non-recovered expenses such as these are amortized. So I think what likely happened is the owner agent went, oh, it's already included, it's already amortized, and they dropped their case. The second decision the board did make a comment on because the same thing was being requested at Triple Four St. Mary. The lump sum of uh, tenant inducements and leasing commissions be deducted for a net effective rent. And again, with this allowance being applied at 7%. So I would agree with the board that that should not be applied. So in the end, what's happened is the, the board's this comment, we will not deduct these allowances, has been taken at face value to mean they don't exist. And I don't think that's plausible because that would result in values which are inconsistent with market value. Right? You'd be ignoring real expenses and you'd be in contradiction of the act. What I think is more plausible is that these comments are being taken out of context. So that's, that's our position on um, the board decisions. Uh, what were the other items that were mentioned? Asset management fees. I mean, they're a small amount of the expenses. They're very relatively small here, but we, we do feel that's to do with the maintenance and sustainability of the income in place whether it be for a portfolio or not, um, it, it's really not an important issue here because it's such a small amount. But if we had a property with asset management fees, we'd say these are real and they should be considered, and an owner, or sorry, a purchaser would consider them. Uh, third item mentioned. I don't recall offhand, but uh, I, I hope I addressed some of those concerns uh, that the assessor has. Okay. Uh, Brent, any questions? I have no questions. All right. I have no questions either, thank you. Okay, on the 4% or 5%, can you show me anywhere in those cases where it was argued that the 5 that the 5% uh, covers in tenant inducements and leasing commissions? Well, what, what we have is if... I know that the, the, uh, 
the agent, the uh, um, appellants tried to argue that uh, it should be deducted from rent. Yeah. Uh, can you show me where it, it says that no, it's already covered by the five percent? Oh, in in those original decisions for the yeah. Original, well, it doesn't actually say that they they apply the five percent allowance. And so if if we work backwards, the the city's assessment guide at the time um, would have been the uh, for the reference year. If I can direct your attention, actually, this might help us, Chair, to page. 71. So I've, I've talked about, uh, well, I started by saying these are real expenses in the market. Secondly, the appraisal theory dictates that we recognize them. Third, other assessment jurisdictions have recognized them. Fourth, the previous manuals up till uh, 2006 would have this kind of language. Now, at the top of page 71, we see from the assessment manual, and, and keep in mind, this would have been guiding the assessment at the time of those decisions that we're discussing. Estimate non-recoverable operating expenses. And it says clearly certain non-recoverable operating expenses are deducted from the effective market income to obtain the net operating income for the property. With current lease arrangements, the operating costs in the typical office building, this is applied for each type of property, uh, are recovered from the tenant. However, even on a net rental basis, there are a number of areas where the property owner must cover expenses. Thus, the effective market income must be reduced by the amount of these unrecoverable expenses to determine the net operating income. And they go through the three different types of deductions. One is shortfall. We understand that. That's what you don't recover when you have a vacancy. The second, though, is, is the key point, Mr. Chairman, is management expense. And this is when there was actually a definition surrounding it. So there's a context placed in the manual. And then they say, say for management, that's simply semantics, it's the term they use. Even with net leases and competent management, there are still will be additional management expenses incurred by the landlord that are non-recoverable from the tenants. The management rate established for, in this case, this is the office, is 5%, and that was applied for all. So what they're saying is management fees, we know, are recovered. I mean, that's an appraisal theory. I quoted the appraisal text to say that management fees are something recovered. That was known. What they're telling us is there are other things that you don't recover. We go back to the appraisal text and we see exactly what we see in the market. These are the expenses that we don't recover. Back to the manual, they're telling us you got to consider them and deduct 5%. And then the other expense, which includes structural reserve, is the additional 2%. So when you put it all together and try and get back into the minds of the board, they're being asked to make a lump sum deduction for these type of items. At the same time, this allowance is being applied which is really those expenses amortized over the life of the building. Now today what we're being, um, what is being suggested is that not only do we not deduct any expenses like these, unrecovered expenses from the face rent, I agree, but also now we're taking away the allowance that was to recognize them. But the, but the municipal board in their rulings made a very clear statement that Tenant inducements and leasing commissions cannot be deducted from income. They said income, not rent. Income. Well, yeah, but the the decisions at the time were all um, addressing the request of making a deduction from the rent. I mean, if if that was really the interpretation, what they're saying is take away a five percent allowance and therefore increase all values, all assessments, sorry, by five percent over market value. And they didn't do that. Those decisions were from 1994, 97, and then I think a couple of 99 following them. And the allowance was consistently. <laughs> yeah, but the allowance was still applied, Mr. Chairman. The 5% was still applied. If that was really their interpretation, which I don't think is plausible, the, the allowance would have been taken away back in 1999. But it stayed in place. The board kept applying that deduction all the way through. They still have it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any summation you wish to have? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, we will go to 215. Uh, okay. As a second and fourth, I will be doing Yes, it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. 215, very yeah. much. See, even Trevor gets more into the argument.
I'm just going to shut this off then for a minute. Sure. Logan has been withdrawn, so we are at 250 McDermott Avenue. So you can begin. Okay, uh, file number, board of revision, revision file number 19 4908. Rule number is 130 Address is 250 McDermott Avenue. It's a designated historic building. The roll year is 2020. The reference date is April 1st, 2018. The assessed value is $1,364,000. Uh, its use is industrial warehouse. A uh, number of the buildings is, uh, it says one here, it's actually two buildings put together uh, over, I don't know when it was done last. Uh, uh, the number of premises is 23. Uh, it's four stories. The actual year built was at 1898. Uh, which is 120 years from the reference date. The effective year built is 1946. Wall height is 11, and it's zone character. Uh, land area is 17,958 square feet. Plan area is 17,528 square feet. Uh, there's a basement area of 14,430 square feet. Gross floor area is 84,542. Uh, square feet. Leasable area is 58,849 square feet. Land to plan area is 1.02 to 1. Uh, if you turn the page to 2, uh, uh, you, see, you see that there is a, uh, there's no sale on the subject, but there was a sworn value of 2.5 million 12 years from the reference date. Uh, and if we turn to page 11 to 13, you see the income expense uh, mailer that they handed in. So on page 13, I just want you to note there uh, the base rent of $212,729. And there's also additional rent of $75,746. Uh, I'm uh, assuming that is parking rent, parking revenue. Uh, if you turn to page 13, there is the rent roll. So yes, there is some vacancy, uh, uh, there's some new leases, uh, and there's some uh, existing tenants there. Also, uh, I just want you to refer to right at the back after page 16, uh, so pages 17 on, uh, I have put uh, the status of title. Now, there is a mortgage. I don't know if the mortgage is just for this one property or if there's more properties involved, but you'll notice that, that the uh, mortgage amount is $22 million on that, right at the bottom there. Okay, so turning back to page 3, uh, there's my comparables. So all, per, uh, all uh, leases are current in relation to the reference date. The effective ages range from 1911 to 1960. The wall heights range from 10 feet to 16 feet. Leasable areas range from approximately 240 square feet to 9,000 square feet. Uh, this is to take into account the different ranges of uh, uh, leasable areas in the property. Uh, their net rents range from $2.50 per square foot to $5 per square foot. Uh, on the following page is our income workup. We're utilizing a poor quality market rental rate of three dollars and sixteen cents, an overall rate. Uh, we're utilizing three fifteen, uh, three sixteen, 16. and that's our uh, poor quality market rent. 
Uh, we're allowing for 12% vacancy to take, out, uh, take into account the vacancy during the reference year. Uh, we're using our highest uh, cap rate uh, at 9.8. Uh, so we're working out the NOI to be 113,694. Uh, turn to the following page uh, after the capitalized uh, cap rate. Uh, we have a capitalized rate of 1,364,224, giving us an assessment of 1,364,000. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Smith and I went and viewed the property together, so I'd just like to hand out some pictures. Uh, it was actually evident, so. Okay. No objection. Well, it is, uh, it is post reference and it is in regard to. There is condition, but I, I suspect that what's going to come up is not with regard to condition. So, Mr. Chairman, when we assess buildings, we are assessing what is there now sure. as if it was there in 2018. So, for 2020, the, the current condition as, as of, of 2018. The, so that's why I'm coming up. If you just go to current condition, then that's fine. Uh, as long as it's with regard to condition, I have no issue with it. Uh, well, I'm not talking about vacancy or anything that's condition of building. Sure. Yeah. Any, anything on vacancy uh, nowadays is obviously post reference. Yeah. So I'll just go through some of the pictures there. Um, so on page one, uh, there is the building. It's uh, located on the corner of uh, Arthur Street and McDermott Avenue. Uh, down at the bottom, uh, we didn't go into this uh, uh, premise, but it's a retail store also. Uh, on the back of page one, we'll start in the basement. Uh, so that's the basement area. There's two basement sides to the building. Um, so that is uh, the basement underneath. Uh, the top picture, you see some new electrical work in there. Uh, on page two, that's the other side of the basement. Uh, underneath uh, the basement picture there, uh, you see a bunch of radiators that they've been pulling out. So they're converting the building from a boiler system, boiler heating system to forced air system. Uh, on the back of page two, uh, we see that there's two freight elevators in the building. Uh, page three is the entrance to the building, not the retail side, but just to where the offices are. So uh, page three, uh, bottom of page three, there's one side is the stairs, one side is the elevator to go up. On the back of page three, there's the other retail store. Uh, so yes, the, the person at the retail store was complaining that the uh, parking is an issue because of the new bike lanes, but uh, it is located in the exchange district. There's always been parking issues. Uh, underneath that, that is the second floor. Um, so you can see there's some uh, construction going on there. Uh, subsequent to the reference date, uh, this uh, the second floor has been leased, and that's what they, they have been uh, doing some work in there. So that. That is the so. I'm where sorry, we're not, that, did we indicate post-reference material? I'm, I'm speaking to the construction that's going on. Yeah, but we don't. The the, the, the uh, issue about it being at least there. Okay, is yeah. We have to the construction cycle. And yeah. it, that is all. Okay, so class. there's the construction that's going on. Page four. Uh, this is still uh, the second area or the second floor. Back of page four. That's still the second uh, level there. Uh, on the top of page five, we see that there is new plumbing in there, uh, new electrical. Uh, on bottom of page five, we see that the, the beams have been stripped of their paint. Uh, they're still standing after 120 years. They're, they've been, uh, been going longer than some of the steel structures in the city. Page, uh, back of page five, uh, again, another picture of the, the, the beam and posts there, uh, bottom. Of, pay, uh, uh, of that page, you see the new electrical that's going in there. Top of page six, uh, there's two 200 watt, uh, 200 amp panels there. Uh, 
page six, there's a, a third, uh, in one of the third floor offices. You can see it's in pretty nice shape. Uh, you can see the ductwork up there, so there's four stair eating in there already. Uh, the following page, at the top, there's the boardrooms uh, of that office. On page seven, uh, Ubisoft is on uh, the third floor, and to get that place uh, up to par, they spent three hundred thousand uh, dollars. There was a permit taken out for three hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, interior when, work. When was that done? Uh, that was done when they moved in. So I, I, they're it? in there right now. So and I, I they're just also to make sure it wasn't post reference. They're also on the rent roll. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, okay, so they weren't there at, at the reference date, but the work okay. has been done. Uh, uh, and then at the bottom of page seven, uh, there's another office there. Page, uh, the next two pages, there's more offices, and on top of page eight, yes, there is some vacancy there. You can see uh, there's some deferred maintenance. The floors aren't in such great shape. Uh, on, um, the fall, on the back of that page, you can see still see some more deferred uh, maintenance. And then page nine, that's the back of the building. You can see there's a parking lot behind the building, so the bottom of page nine, that's one section of the parking lot. There's two rows for parking there. And then the following page, right behind that, those two rows, there's another two rows of parking. Uh, and then uh, I just wanted to, uh, the, the work that's going on there, there's been permits taken out. Uh, so uh, okay, permits yes. are in the value of 300000 1.4 million and 1.3 million. The uh, permits are, uh, uh, are not speaking to uh, are not photo we read to the photo that you don't realize there were the permits here. Um, uh, the permit uh, talks to the, uh, so the, the work that's, that's being done in, in, your, in your brief in general. They all it's not rebuttal people. evidence, it's new evidence, so we're not permitting the uh, permits to be entered into evidence. That speaks to the work that's being done. <coughs> it's also uh, it's new evidence. It's new evidence that you want to conclude permits should be done in your main brief. Okay. Um, yeah, and it is post reference. I haven't even looked at it. The, the work that's being done there is done so right now, whatever's been done right now. So we're assessing what's there now as a. Permits aren't what's there now, that's what it may be. Anyhow, it's uh, okay. should have been included in your main brief if it was relevant. Okay, so I'll continue. So taking into consideration the sworn value of 2.5 million in 2006. Uh, the work that's being uh, currently underway, uh, I believe that the present assessment of 1.364 million is uh, is fair and uh, equitable, and I believe the, the board should confirm that value. I'll just stop there. Okay. Questions, Mr. Smith? I do. So, uh, <coughs> you have. Uh, Noted the subject sale history on your page number two, December 6, 2006. Correct. Consideration of one dollar's form value of 2.5 million. Yes. Uh, yes. What investigation has the city done regarding that sale? They, uh, this is from 2006. This is what they had, uh, I guess, the owner had provided to the city as the form value. But no further investigation has been done. We don't. Council. We don't come up with the sworn value. They pay the taxes on that. So uh, I'm aware of that. The so the date of that is 2006. Two right. years from the reference date. Correct. Right. So what relevance would that have with regard to the valuation date of April one? Well, we're showing that the value of the building is not going to go down over. Uh, Okay, uh, but time. no further investigation has been done with regard to the sale, correct? It, no, it wasn't okay. a sale, it was a sworn value. All right. <clears throat> so, as you noted, uh, we did 
uh, inspect uh, the property together or do a walkthrough at, uh, at a minimum. Um, and uh, we, uh, we had a, <coughs> an interview with uh, one of the main floor uh, retail tenants. Correct. correct. And uh, as you noted, she, she uh, had, some, uh, <coughs> had some issues with regard to the installation of the bike lanes, of the bike lanes uh, immediately in front of the building and on the adjacent uh, roadways. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and what were her problems with the parking? Yeah, it's downtown parking. So it removed it removed uh, parking correct. from the area for her potential uh, her existing and potential clients, correct? Correct. And what what were her comments with regard to the viability of her business before and after the installation of those? Uh, I think she said the business is going down, but we see that there's professionals who are coming to lease that building now. So. If I if I recall, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, she had indicated that her she moved in and her business was uh, was trending upwards, and then uh, the bicycle lanes were installed in the neighborhood, removing uh, the parking, and uh, her business has dropped uh, significantly, and she's not sure if she's going to. I remember continue. she's. I remember her saying that her business has dropped. Okay, uh, I believe she also mentioned. Um, others uh, in the neighborhood, not specifically in her building, uh, that have also experienced the same thing. There's been uh, publication <coughs> in local uh, uh, local news articles as well. Correct. Uh, I have read some articles in the yes. Okay. As of, uh, as of the valuation date, uh, you, you the, uh, the future tenant uh, that was being discussed was uh, was not uh, a tenant of uh, the building at that time, correct? Correct. Um, sure that we cover the ground that needs to be covered here. The <coughs> rentable, leaseable area that uh, the city has of 58,849, um, there's, <coughs> there's a gap of roughly 2,000 or <coughs> 2,000 plus square feet between that and uh, the actual rentable area from uh, the property management of the uh, of the uh, property. Can you explain the, the uh, golf no, area? I don't know what, uh, why there's a discrepancy. Okay. The two buildings uh, that are in discussion as a single property, two buildings that are adjoined, uh, they were both uh, constructed uh, roughly turn of the century, 1898, correct? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have a, an effective year built of 1946. Yes. I'm uh, just wondering what uh, there's, is going on. There's been, uh, I guess there's been upkeep. They're not turn of century style buildings right now. No, and nobody denies that things change so over time. So that's why they're 1946. But 1946 seems a, a significant jump from the original construction date. Uh, just wondering what the, the detail that went into well, that. I'm was. sure they'll be coming up for the next assessment as well. The, uh, the vacancy rate uh, that's applied uh, at 12 percent. Did the city look at uh, the historic and current vacancy? Yes, of the property? we did, and that's why we're allowing 12 percent and not 6 percent, which is market. And what was the vacancy? We're at, we're allowing 12 percent vacancy. Right, but what was the vacancy for the property? Uh, I don't know offhand. I have my notes uh, at my office. Okay. You had uh, mentioned parking as uh, as being on site, correct? There is rental. Uh, there's parking uh, revenue that's generated from the parking lot with that. So <clears throat> I'm not sure. 
sure that it shows in your brief because it's not an aerial. Uh, when I look at the uh, when I look at uh, the boundaries of the subject mm -hmm. property, there is no actual on-site parking. There is an adjacent parking lot, uh, which I does not form part of the, uh, the subject property. So that would be an, an adjacent revenue from an adjacent lot that perhaps the owner owns as well, correct? Uh, it could be, yes. And uh, as has been covered very eloquently uh, by the first appellant today, uh, Mr. Slaughter, he, the city's position with regard to uh, <coughs> The expenses that are allowed uh, is such that uh, the city believes that the former 5%, uh, what was termed management allowance, uh, is uh, actually recovered from tenants and is no longer uh, included in the expense allowances, correct? And that the overall the historic 5% management was in fact the management expense, which is not allowed because our data shows that it's being recovered. Uh, so the overall non-recoverable expense has been reduced to 2% plus the they short They were always 2%, yes. Mm, I'm sorry, they were always 2%? The 2% recoverables were always 2% recoverable. There was a 5% management fee and a 2% recoverable. And so it's the city's position that the, the, uh, uh, the market has changed, I suppose, and that uh, management fees are now recoverable, whereas they weren't in the past? Correct. Okay. Um, sorry, just one last thing. I guess the, at the very back of your brief there, there is a um, status of title document with regard to uh, the subject property, and it indicates the uh, mortgage amount, etc. cetera. The city's aware that that is uh, not specific to the well, individual well, we're not property, really but that it's, covered, it's covering more than uh, a single property under that That's mortgage. what I assume, and that's why we're not relying on that. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that information. Uh, those are all my questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions, Vince? Uh, if you're not relying on the title, why put it in the brief? Just to show the title. To see what the uh, what's on that uh, title, so there's the lots and whatnot. So. Um, if I go to your page 13, as of the uh, rent roll, December 1st, 2017, there's 32,669 square feet of vacant space okay. at the bottom of it. The last, the second last line, vacant square foot, 57.78, Oh, yes, yep, yep. Is this chronic vacancy? Uh, well, it, it's been fluctuating. There's 24, there's 57, there's, uh, so, but I'm not sure if that, you know, how it's been going for the last few years before this, but. Uh, I have some notes at the office. Uh, I don't know what the rates were. Uh, I know there was 24% a uh, couple of years. Uh, I don't know why it's 57 now. So. And, and it could be because uh, they're renovating and they wanted people out of there. I'm not sure. But typically, what would you provide with this chronic vacant? Well, our market is showing that it's 12% uh, would be for that type of property in that neighborhood. Okay, that was all my questions. Okay. Any questions? I just had a clarification one. It looks like you have about 23 tenants. Uh, 23 premises, yes. Yeah. Are they all um, retail office? No, the, from what I saw when we inspected, there was two retail at the bottom. Okay. Uh, one was a jewelry shop. We didn't go to the other one. Uh, I don't know what it was. I, I think it's a jewelry shop. And what's the, what's the rest of it? Office? Office. Uh, there's professionals moving in there. Uh, is there any relationship, business relationship between the tenants or are they just sort of random? I'm not sure. I don't know any relationships. So. Okay. And then um, I guess
was just a sort of general question. All of your workup is based on the model. Have you adjusted anything for um, for actuals or uh, no, for actuals? No, we're, we're using market uh, data. So. Okay. Um, just another one last question. If, the effect, if it was built in 1898, that's a long time ago, and mm -hmm. you've got an effective of 1946, which right. is still a long time ago, um, you've used market expenses. Um, how close are they to the uh, actual trend? Uh, no, sorry, I meant you've used model expenses. Well, 2% is what we're seeing across the board. So Even in this type of uh, Well, across the board, it? so uh, that, uh, yeah. But in a subset, or how does it compare with your actuals then? I do nothing. Uh, okay, so then it doesn't make a subset in the model of. No, we we're not appraising individual properties. We're. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I so, understand yeah, that. Yeah, no, uh, so no, we haven't. Uh, so a warehouse of 1946-1898, it goes into the same model to create this number as it does for a warehouse so two you, years old. Can you repeat that question? Though? Well, I'm just asking. Like the model isn't stratified in any way. Like this is the model for all. Correct, and we adjust, the, we adjust the cap rate okay. for the... So that's your adjustment. Uh, our cap rate is the adjustment. Okay. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you. Okay, and I have no questions for you. Can you begin? Okay, great. Uh, may I take one minute? I have a delivery that just came in for okay. me. It will be form part of this, I believe. So we are dealing with uh, 250 McDermott Avenue today. It is, as noted uh, already, a four-story heritage warehouse uh, building in uh, the uh, West Exchange District. Um, if you look at my page number one, we have the background detail for you. The <coughs> property uh, is comprised of two buildings. Uh, Built in 1898. I don't have the, didn't print out the attributes page. I think they were both built uh, very around the exact same time, so one maybe a couple of years later. I'm not, I don't have the actual uh, date of the second one, but uh, the original construction date was 1898 for the main building. I'm assuming that the second one was, was the same from my review of that document earlier. Uh, total site area is just under 18,000 square feet and uh, the leasable area uh, as measured by property management is 56,540 square feet. Uh, so you'll notice that there is a delta there between the city's uh, area for the subject and uh, the property as measured by a professional property management corporation. Property is zoned uh, C character. And it actually has a uh, heritage designation that uh, has been put on it as well. I think if you look at the back of the city's brief in the title documentation, it will note that in 2012 uh, it received uh, registration from the city of Winnipeg as a historic property notice. So uh, with that notice, obviously there are restrictions with regard to the property and as far as uh, what can and can't be done to it, and what uh, what needs to be preserved, etc. So that is a, a factor in valuation as well. Um, let's oh, still on page number one. You can see that uh, in 2018 the property was reduced from 1,302,000 to 1,039,000. Uh, I will point out at this time that I did not represent the client at that time, uh, so that's not my valuation that uh, uh, was uh, was decided upon in the 2018 cycle. Um, <coughs> 
generally, uh, there's been uh, some discussion with regard to the building. You've seen a number of photos here. Um, the building uh, originally constructed in 1898. It is a masonry brick and beam warehouse building. Uh, there's uh, quite a number of these, obviously, in our downtown uh, exchange district. Uh, this is uh, this is one of many. The uh, property uh, uh, has uh, obviously had uh, changes to it since 1898, as all properties do, and we can uh, we can look at those those details. Obviously, we want to be correct in what's being portrayed. If you look at um, the uh, pictures beginning on page two, we can look at the subject property. And again, we're looking at the general overall condition here. The exterior is shown on uh, <coughs> the top of page number two, <coughs> and the frontage on McDermott. Uh, it may be a little difficult to see there, but there is a bicycle laneway that runs all along McDermott, crossing uh, <coughs> crossing Main Street uh, directly in front of the subject parking. So any uh, street front parking has been removed from the front of the building. And in fact, on the side street, Arthur, there is another bicycle lane as well where, uh, <coughs> where uh, all on-street parking has uh, effectively been removed as well. In fact, when we were there, uh, when I was walking up to the building, there was a parking inspector that was in the process of uh, handing out a number of tickets to people that were parked in the bicycle lane and uh, removing those vehicles. The, uh, we'll speak to that uh, a little bit later, but that's a bit of background for you. Bottom of page two gives you the entrance uh, to the building. The remainder of the photographs um, are a selection of uh, areas within the property. So uh, common area hallway at the very rear of the building at the top of page number three. Uh, the bottom of page three shows uh, one of the suites uh, that is, uh, has been vacated. This was uh, a costume museum of Manitoba, I believe. The bottom of uh, page, or rather top of page number four is the rear area of, uh, of one of the uh, jewelry shops on the main floor. The front area, uh, unfortunately, they didn't include the photo of that. The front area is obviously nicer than that and, uh, and uh, would show better than the rear uh, production area, uh, but that is what the back looks like. Uh, bottom of page four, again, circulation area. This is a significantly old building and uh, obviously, the wear and tear over its uh, more than a century of life is quite significant. Bottom of top of page five gives you uh, a fairly good indication of uh, a typical <clears throat> typical suite in the building. They are generally wide open, post and beam. Uh, some of the floors have been refinished, such as this one. They're open to the deck with your piping and uh, HVAC, etc. Uh, visible. Uh, within the space itself. So that's that's the type of space that we're looking at. Um, bottom just gives you the brickwork. And then we have uh, the freight uh, elevator shown, uh, which is roughly in the middle of the building. And then uh, another portion of the tenant space at the bottom of page number six. Now, there is some variety within the building. There are a couple of units that have had, uh, had money put into them where the fit the finish is somewhat nicer. The floors have been redone. Uh, some of the some of the other finish uh, has been upgraded, etc. So uh, that that certainly is present. But by by and large, uh, the majority of the building is uh, is as portrayed in the photos that you can see. Looking at page number seven, uh, we have the site description or the site aerial. So you can see that there are the two buildings on site. Uh, you can see that there's a gap in between them. That's actually a laneway uh, that's covered over by the property itself. So there's a, a tunnel essentially there that takes you from Arthur back to the rear laneway uh, at the rear of the building. And uh, again, if you look at the outline in red of the site itself, it corresponds with the blue 
of the actual roll number, and you can see that uh, the parking lot that's being referred to is not actually part of uh, the property that we're looking at today. So the parking is, is a separate uh, separate piece entirely, so it's not, not included in the valuation. The location, I think we're all aware of, it's shown on page number eight, uh, West Exchange, just west of Main Street. And we can move on to page number nine. Uh, this is a fairly important piece, I think. We have uh, a typical floor plan. This is the fourth floor here. And just to guide you through, if we look at uh, the left-hand side of that, uh, of that drawing there of the floor plan, that would be uh, the front area of the building. Make sure that we're correct there. Nope, I do apologize. It's actually the reverse, so the right-hand side is uh, the McDermott frontage. And you can see the stairwell access with uh, the vintage uh, heritage uh, elevator uh, towards the bottom right-hand corner. And then we have hallway beginning there, heading towards the left, takes a jog up to the right, runs all the way to the top of the building uh, as well in the center. So you take another left, takes you back to uh, roughly two-thirds of the way through the diagram. You head towards the bottom again, takes another jog towards the left at the back of the building, and then it splits and goes around that where it says 412 there. So you have a common area that goes to the very bottom of the site plan, as well as continuing around 412 and going to the stairwell at the back where the uh, the stairs and fire escape uh, essentially are. So this is an exceptional amount of uh, common area space within uh, a building. It is, of course, uh, I guess you could call it typical of these old warehouse buildings that have been converted from their original full floor production to multi-tenant uh, situations. So there's uh, an extensive amount of common area that is present in uh, the subject building. Uh, description uh, of the property itself, obviously masonry post and beam uh, has had significant settling and shifting over time as one would expect uh, and the finish uh, has uh, had significant uh, wear and tear over that time. As noted there has been some upgrading and it's presently going through some upgrading, not complete. Uh, for some uh, some future tenancies. Uh, that is, of course, in the future. We are on a two-year cycle. Anything that uh, uh, happens to the building, uh, tenancy-wise, is caught within that two-year cycle, and that value, of course, is attributed to the appropriate time frame, which would be the next cycle. The renovations of the property, uh, some of this has been shown. There is a a renovation uh, underway for one tenancy, you can see that it's nowhere near complete. Uh, there is um, uh, some electrical work, etc., that uh, is being done in concert with that. So we're not hiding that fact. It, uh, it is part of, uh, part of the property itself. So let's move into the valuation itself. <coughs> or rather on to my page number 10, uh, as these points do need to be considered as well. Uh, property uh, transacted as part of a portfolio sale uh, in December of 2017. Uh, it uh, does not have a specific breakout as to, uh, as to the value of the building at that time. It was part of an entire package and <coughs> following the city's guidelines as well as appraisal guidelines. Uh, properties that are purchased as part of a portfolio are not uh, to be considered with regard to uh, the valuation that is attributed to them as there's many factors that go into the acquisition of these including beneficial financing, etc. Functional obsolescence. 
certainly applicable to the subject property. Functional obsolescence occurs when a property loses value due to its architectural design, building style, size, outdated amenities, local economic conditions, and changing technology. Uh, clearly evident in the subject. Economic obsolescence. Economic obsolescence occurs when a property loses value because of external factors, such as local traffic pattern changes, or the construction of public nuisance type properties and utilities, such as jails, sewage treatment plants, things of that nature. The issue with regard to the subject property, obviously, is uh, a significant impact with regard to the, the viability of, uh, of the subject or the draw of the subject to tenants when their uh, on-street uh, parking for clients uh, as well as customers for main floor tenants is severely restricted. Uh, we've heard discussion regarding this. Uh, I've discussed this with uh, a number of tenants, not just main floor, and it is having a significant impact on, uh, on uh, their businesses uh, in the building. Not, not just retail, but office. When your clientele has difficulty in, uh, in easily getting to your buildings, particularly in a winter city such as Winnipeg, if one has to walk uh, significant dif distances. Okay, we're spending a lot of time on preliminary stuff, and the yeah. issue seems to be vacancy and, of course, the uh, non-recoverables in that. Certainly. I can move on. Um, I'm, simply I'm, just, I'm just saying we're being pressed for time. The room is needed for 1 o'clock. So. All right. I will keep that in mind, and uh, we can move on relatively quickly. Uh, these do inform the value, and that's why I'm pointing them out. Physical obsolescence uh, occurs when a property uh, it obviously deteriorates over time. It's not significant gross management, it's simply a property that was built in 1898 and has the wear and tear commensurate with life. Let's move on to the valuation itself. The page number 12, what we've given you here is a background of the income expense history of the subject property as uh, reported to the City of Winnipeg on the income and expense questionnaires that they have in their possession. So we have 2012 through 2017 here. You can see the base rent amounts uh, descending from 2012, 278,000, dropping, dropping, 2017, we have $212,729. Um, it is a gross rent basis here for the most part uh, with one or two exceptions, so we have added in the additional rent, and you can see the gross rent amounts. Deducting expenses from that, you can see a, the actual net revenue or net income that the property derives, and in 2012 and 2013, it was a fairly minimal 33, 36,000, and then in 2015 through 2017, we have a negative cash flow situation where the property was actually losing money over that time frame. This is all information that the city has in their possession as well. Let's move on to <clears throat> the leases in place, etc. So, subject property le leases are listed on page number 13. As mentioned, it is a, a gross lease situation for the most part. So we have deducted the actual expense amounts on a per square foot basis to bring these back to a net, uh, net rental rate. You can see those figures shown in the right-hand column of uh, the chart. As well, you can see the significant amount of vacancy shown in the second column there where we've indicated whether the street was vacant or not. <clears throat> so our rents uh, obviously uh, vary significantly and uh, we have a significant amount of vacancy. Now, uh, our, uh, what is an appropriate uh, net rental rate for the subject property? When we have property that has this amount of vacancy, obviously that uh, is an indicator of uh, both the amount of space similar to this that's on the marketplace as well as uh, what one is willing to pay for it. So we've presented some rental comparables on page number 14. They are all uh, heritage warehouse uh, facilities in that exchange area with 136 Market, 115 Bannatyne, and 289 King. Uh, the 
uh, rental rate comparables are shown there at the top, relatively recent rents, uh, varying in size, all loft warehouses, ages of 1905, 1899, 1935. All of these will have had some updating over time as well. We have a, a rent range from three and a quarter up to five dollars per square foot. Looking at uh, vacancy for the subject property and uh, <coughs> uh, the build-out, etc., we felt that uh, a rental rate of $3.25 a square foot uh, overall would be appropriate for the subject property. Um, there's further text with regard to that on page 15. Moving on to the expense side of the equation, vacancy. Uh, we have given you the Johnson Report vacancy with regard to industrial properties at the top of the page. Uh, none of these is specific to loft warehouses. Uh, I'll point to the bottom. We have multi-tenant investment vacancy of between 6.7 and 7 percent. Uh, subject is uh, loft warehouse, so it's not directly addressed to this. We've added office vacancy in the middle of the page, as many of the tenants in here are our office tenancies, you can see Class C ranging between 8.7% and 11% essentially for downtown Class C space. The subject you could consider following somewhat within the Class C uh, range, perhaps somewhat uh, below that as well. With regard to the subject itself, uh, <clears throat> the vacancy issue here is chronic. Uh, and has been ongoing and is, uh, that information is available to the city and the IMEs as well. If you look at the chart at the bottom of the page, you can see that there was 40%, uh, 48% vacancy in 2012, 2013. I did not have the 2014 information available. And then we have 52.7, 51.9, and 57.8% vacancy. This is not... Uh, this is not typical within the marketplace. This is chronic and ongoing as shown. Uh, and again, this information is available to the city. What the city has done in addressing this in the past is apply their upper end of uh, vacancy to the market valuations of 25% for loft warehouses which have chronic vacancy. That is the standard. That is what we are asking for in our valuation. 12% uh, does not cover the vacancy issue that is faced at this place. With regard to the expense allowance, um, the uh, position uh, that we presented has been clarified many times. I will, I guess, try and keep this relatively concise as we have a number of properties to get through here. Uh, suffice it to say, uh, the city has now reduced the overall uh, non-recoverable expense to 2%, formerly allowing a, an overall 7% allowance, which was comprised of what they termed 5% management and a 2% other. It was always stated in hearings that it was 2% for structural reserve as well as 5% for management. The management term was a misnomer and was always intended to be representative of non-recoverable expenses that a landlord will incur in the marketplace as a regular course of business where these, <coughs> these costs are not recovered from tenants under standard lease terms. The uh, theory behind this is very clear. Uh, I've presented the text from the Appraisal Institute of Canada information in the middle of the page. From the income approach to value, it specifically outlines how arriving at a net operating income is to be done and the expenses that are to be taken out. The uh, expense items that should be included in this, and this has already been covered by others, but I will point it out. If we look at the bottom of my page number 17, the line items that should be considered uh, but not limited to these are the following, professional fees, legal and accounting, asset management, as already mentioned, asset management is uh, an actual cost to the ownership. Uh, it is uh, a rare one and uh, not, not common in the marketplace, but does form a part of the non-recoverable expenses. Landlord work, landlord work represents bringing a unit up to a shell space, uh, essentially, uh, to uh, 
being able to be leased so or for our tenant improvements to be done uh, either by the tenants or by the landlord themselves. Leasing commissions, obviously tenants are not going to pay the leasing commissions that a landlord faces for putting themselves into uh, a building or other tenants uh, that have leased space within that building. That is not a, an expense that a tenant will be paying, uh, nor should they. Tenant improvements, uh, already covered. This is a contentious issue. Um, the owner repair and maintenance, this is exclusive of structural repair. There are items that come up that would not fall under your typical structural repair. Marketing of the building, obviously uh, investment property, one has to hire leasing agents, uh, professionals to uh, draw tenants to the building, uh, market the space, show it, um, and uh, go through the negotiation process of signing a lease. That is all marketing. That is a cost that's borne by the owner themselves. In a competitive marketplace, uh, you have tenant inducements, such as free rent. Certainly with uh, vacancies such as this, that is a significant factor with regard to the subject. And then we have credit checks. And in a very limited number of cases, we have property management fees. Uh, this has already been noted. Uh, and I'll be clear on this. By and large, uh, in the, nearly all cases within the marketplace, property management is a recoverable expense. It always has been. It always will be. It's uh, written into standard uh, leases such that uh, tenants are responsible for property management fees. This has not changed over the 25-year period that the city has been doing this. The, uh, the only exceptions are where you have some, uh, in some cases, government leases where they make exceptions for property management fees um, or very, very limited number of uh, additional tenants. So that covers background with regard to the non-recoverable expenses. It's very clear that uh, these are uh, expenses that are incurred by the landlord, the theory is clear that they should be taken into account in establishing the net operating income. What we have done at Stevenson is a three-year study of these non-recoverable expenses. I've covered this with uh, at least two of the panel members numerous times, I know, so I'll be brief. You can see the study running from 2016 through 2018. The number of properties that were involved on the right-hand side and the right-hand column and the resultant uh, percentage of effective gross income that non-recoverable expenses formed. Three-year average for non-recoverable expenses exclusive of tenant improvements was 11.5%. Inclusive of tenant improvements was 12.7%. Now that is on a sample size of 45 to 53 properties. Uh, clearly, it's, uh, <coughs> these costs are significant and uh, should be recognized within the valuation of these properties. The, uh, we're not at this time asking for an increase to the allowance, we're simply asking for the reinstitution of the original 5% non-recoverable that the City of Winnipeg has always allowed in their valuation model. Shortfall allowance. We have uh, an actual operating expense of $5.57 $5 a square foot in the reference year. If you look at the prior years, uh, it's in and around that range, around $6 per square foot. Uh, in recognition of the higher vacancy, we're not asking for uh, the full recovery of this. We're simply asking using the $3.75 a square foot in our valuation. With regard to capitalization rate, we are in agreement with the City of Winnipeg at 9.8%. And our valuation is summed up on page number 19. Uh, capitalizing the net income using our parameters gives us a market value of $767,000. The addenda materials for the property include the income and expense materials, um, the uh, yes, income and expense materials, and numerous uh, supportive decisions with regard to the 5% non-recoverable issue from this point in time. And at the very back, we have a uh, uh, discussion regarding uh, multi-role, uh, multi-parcel sales and their non-admissibility. 
and I'm open for questions. Any questions? Yes. Uh, so you said this property was part of a portfolio sale. When was that sale? Uh, I think I indicated where where it was in uh, 2017. Uh, that information's in the in the brief here somewhere. How many properties were part of that sale? It was a significant number. Do you know how many? I don't have uh, the information in front of me today, but it was a significant number. One, two, five, ten. I've already answered the question. So, the the vacancy during the period that you indicate here, from 2012 to 2017, was there any upgrades going on during that period? Um, if we look at uh, <coughs> We look at uh, the material with regard to any upgrades. I think 20, late 2015, uh, they began perhaps some upgrades, but it it doesn't uh, it, it wasn't renovations to the units where tenants were evicted or anything of that nature. So, so they started in the vacancy. So the vacancy goes up in 2015. Yeah. So Seriously? I I. I Spoken to that, uh, the detail with regard to the vacancy is shown on my page number 16, and uh, uh, the vacancy goes up marginally uh, at that point. But again, we're not talking about tenants being picked out of suites. Okay. Um, so when we visited the property, you were in agreement that there was uh, major upgrades going on. Upgrades to the building, yes. There was uh, renovations going on to uh, uh, a couple of spaces, yes. So would you say landlord work or tenant improvements contribute to the overall value of the property? Uh, well, the overall condition of, a, of the property obviously has, uh, has an impact on, uh, on market value, yes. So in your opinion, with the owner be willing to sell this property at $767,000 in 2018? That is not... Uh, With the store value of 2.5? So, let's, uh, let's be clear here. You're going back in time to 2006 and looking at a, a sworn value with a consideration of $1. So, you do not have background okay, so information in your on that. Would, would you be a willing seller at... $767,000. It's, it's not a question I've asked him, nor is it exactly what we're valuing today. We're looking at market value on uh, according to the, uh, well, the uh, market information. Market value is the willing buyer and a willing seller, correct? Well, yes, we're all clear on that point. With uh, respect, I mean, we're talking about, uh, we're speculating on what the owner's intention might be, so okay. I don't know how. So I have no further questions. Okay, Brent, do you have any questions? I have no questions. Kelly? I have no questions either, thank you. Okay, and I have no questions. Um, let's move on to 935 Henry. I'm being cognizant of time, so let's uh, be to the point. So you know there's a non-co-op on this one, so on the non-co-op, first of all. Okay, so should I just start with the file number and all? Yeah, read them and then get things from there and then... Uh, okay, so uh, board of revision, file number 19-1965, roll number is 130-9225-1100, address is 935 Henry Avenue. The year is 2020, reference date is April 1st, 2018. The assessed value is $1.561 million. Uh, parcel use is uh, warehouse, industrial warehouse. There's five number of buildings, it's five. Number of premises is seven. Number of stories is one to two. Actual year built was 1915 to 2002. We're using an effective year built of 1951. Wall height is 9 feet to 24 feet. Zoning is manufacturing heavy, M3. Uh, the land area is 93,667 square feet or 
1.15 acres. Plan area is 20,856 square feet. Basement area is 4,800 square feet. The gross floor area is 38,456 square feet, and the leasable area is 33,939 square feet. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but are we, where are we going yeah. to deal with here? Uh, I was just going to come to that, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Usually, I'm, and I'm sorry, I do apologize, and I don't mean to in, insert myself, but normally that's uh, addressed up front, because <coughs> then I would have to present if it's accepted. Yeah, you know, I was asking him to speak to the non co He went a little bit beyond just the... Uh, the roll number and uh, okay, so yeah, uh, the ATD is uh, asking for uh, that the burden could be placed on the applicant for non co op. Uh, and if we turn to the next page, uh, we see that the response uh, has not been provided. Actually, it was provided, uh, yeah, it, it hasn't been provided. Uh, it was provided in 2017, uh, but or 2016, but in 2017. Uh, no responses were provided in 2013 and 2016. No responses were provided on June 8, 2018. We sent out registered uh, mail, and that's located on page 11 to 14. Um, so yeah, if you could do on that. One. So we're asking uh, the burden of proof be placed on the uh, applicant, and if there is any reduction in assessment, uh, that the, they follow uh, the board follows uh, section 54. Uh, 3.2 of the Act, uh, stating that fifth year deferral of one year. Okay. Do you have questions on uh, this assessor's material? Um, <clears throat> just looking at uh, at it here. So the the notice was uh, sent to 714 Maryland Street. Correct. And that's where the tax bill and Correct. everything goes. I, I, I have see no comments. Yes. Okay. I have uh, no comments. Any questions of the assessor? Yeah, no questions. Okay. Do you, uh, number one, are you contesting the non-core? I have no background information beyond that to the supply. Okay. So you have no evidence. Of... All right. I guess we will. Uh, Maybe just take a brief break and go into the next step. Maybe use rest to do that. Okay, we're going to grant the non-co-op on this one, so uh, you can proceed, Mr. Smith. Okay. And again, be cognizant of time. With yes, lack of I will be as efficient as possible here. So, looking at 935 Henry Avenue, <clears throat> we have a heavy industrial property zoned M3, manufacturing heavy, uh, originally constructed uh, between, well, Original construction was 1915, uh, the most recent is 2002, which I'm not sure what section of the building that represents, um, as the majority of the building, as you'll see from the photos, is significantly older than that. Perhaps there was a very minor addition. Uh, however, it's uh, the building uh, overall condition and age is uh, significantly, uh, significantly older. Um, <coughs> 
uh, looking at my page number one, the basic facts are there. We're looking at a leasable area of just under 34,000 square feet. Uh, land to plan area ratio 3.25 to 1, uh, 2.2 acres. And if we look at the cover photo of uh, my brief, you can see the site itself. It backs onto the main CPR lines uh, on Henry Avenue. <coughs> And uh, the, it abuts on the eastern side, is that uh, called the Slaw Remshuk Bridge? I'm forgetting the, the name of it now. In any case, it takes you from the south side of the CPR lines over to uh, the north side. This particular area <coughs> is shown on my page number eight. You can see the aerial here. We're just west of it's the Arlington Street Bridge. Um, taking you over the CPR lines there. This is a heavy industrial area, older. If you look at <clears throat> the roadway coming into uh, the street off of, uh, off of uh, Route 47 there, we're looking at uh, a gravel roadway, which is the Trinity Street, uh, Trinity Street access. Uh, the actual physical address is on Henry, which comes from the west, but uh, the property is accessed from the south from uh, Trinity Street. So that uh, takes you in. You actually have to cross a railway, uh, as shown on my page number seven, in order to get over to uh, the property itself. So this is the type of area that the property is within. It's older, it's dated, it's not in good condition. Um, demand uh, in this area is certainly lower. The type of uses that you would get will be dirtier. Uh, in fact, uh, they are for uh, the tenants uh, that are in place. And uh, you get the other issues that come along with this with regard to uh, uh, vandalism, crime, uh, etc. in the neighborhood just by virtue of uh, the location itself. The photos of the property begin on page number two. You have the overall aerial there, then you have the on-site picture uh, <coughs> from the frontage on Henry and uh, some exteriors of the two buildings as well. The uh, bottom picture of page three is the westernmost building. The top is the easternmost building, and then we can go inside. Uh, you can see the heavy industrial use for this property. <clears throat> it uh, is significantly worn. There has been no upgrades to it. Uh, the middle property uh, is a bit unique. It has uh, main floor bays, kind of, and then some very oddly Oddly denied and uh, oddly accessed uh, office area at the top. Not office space that an office tenant would lease, certainly. It's just uh, an add-on to uh, the basement space. The access to it is shown on page number six. So that's the type of property we're looking at and the location that it's in. Let's move on to the value. Page number 11. You can see the rents that were in place as of year-end 2016. We did not have the 2017 information to rely on, so we're looking at the information from, <coughs> from that time period. The gross, and it's operated on a gross basis, if you look at the rents in place and make the deductions to come down to the net rents, you can see that we range from a little over a dollar up to uh, just under eight dollars, with the majority of them in that uh, one, two, four plus uh, dollar range. Average rental rate, three dollars and 23 cents a square foot for the space. So let's look at the market and see if these are at market. The rental comparables that we've shown you are in similar areas uh, for properties that uh, are, are uh, in similar demand, um, many of them older, heritage type uh, warehouse properties such as this in that uh, Point Douglas uh, area or areas similar to this. So 55 Mordaunt, which we're dealing with today. We have two uh, net, once you deduct the, uh, they're operated on a gross basis, once you deduct the uh, expenses, we come down to roughly $2.50 a square foot. Property built in 84 in a very similar location, backing onto rail in that uh, Point Douglas area as noted. Higgins, 
68 Higgins, we have rents uh, ranging from just under $3 up to 350 roughly. Uh, you can see the age of that building there. 10A Higgins, we have a gross rent uh, that's basically covering some costs at just under $2. And 9 to 11 Higgins, they were asking a rent of $3.50 a square foot. We have a couple of other asking rents for similar properties, all in and around that you know, 3, 325, 375 range. Um, subject property, uh, you can see the average that we came to was $3.23 a square foot uh, once deductions for expenses were made. And to bring it back to a net basis, um, we have uh, attributed an increase to this uh, to use a rental rate of $3.75 a square foot. This is not a building that will have occupancy all of the time. Uh, it, it's simply not. It's an ongoing issue there. The rents that they are able to drive are not high. 375 is certainly more than a fair rental rate for uh, those buildings in that location, in the condition uh, that they are in. Moving on to the expense side, vacancy, we've attributed 7 or rather 6% vacancy to the subject property. The information is there for you. The 5 and 2% are applied as well as the shortfall of $3.75 a square foot. And we can move on to the capitalization rate. Uh, cap rate that the city of Winnipeg has used of 9.8% we feel is appropriate. When you look at uh, the photos of the property, you look at the condition of it, you look at the location of it, you look at the, the uh, <coughs> quality of the rental stream that uh, the investor will get, 9.8% uh, uh, is certainly not uh, not uh, out of range for the subject and we felt was appropriate so we've used 9.8 percent in our analysis as well this gives us our market value of one million and fifty seven thousand dollars thank you Good questions ah uh, yes um, uh, on your page 11 uh, you have your comparables there at the bottom mm -hmm. and then you're using uh, i guess these are gross rents and then you netted them uh, -huh. uh for the Mardon property, yes. Yes, and same with the Higgins. Uh, so uh, yes. So the how did you figure out the net? Uh, did you just take the expenses? Were they stabilized, or we have uh, we represent the owners for these properties, so we had the information with regard to income and expenses. So you just made the appropriate uh, adjustments to arrive at the net. So you just took all their expenses, subtracted without stabilizing or anything? We used the appropriate valuation model in arriving at the net rental rates. I'm just wondering why you're using a gross and not a net rent. Like I have pictures of those properties and the rents that they included. Mm -hmm. So why would you use the net? Was there no gross or net leases you could find? You're using gross leases. We had no no appropriate uh, net rental rates uh, in the marketplace that would be similar to the subject that we had available to us. And uh, with respect, we've gone through the appropriate exercise in arriving at the net rental rates for those properties. They've already been heard before the board in this cycle. The information is public. It's all there. Uh, these rents uh, are what they are um, and are indicative of the demand for such properties. Well, if you wanted to compare gross rents, I could give you the gross rents. They're all in the six dollar uh, range. So, uh, in regards to... So that would be a gross figure, correct? If you wanted to compare so gross, I could compare the grosses with you, but you won't net at them so much. Should we value properties on a gross basis? Well, that's what we've basis? done here. Well, let's, let's not get into uh, the Why rates. are you using a 600 square foot uh, property there? Uh, I can give you the And the other ones are just asking, mm -hmm. so they're not leases in place, I take it? Uh, you see the information in front of you, yes. It, it is correct, they are asking rents if it says they're asking rents. Doesn't mean they're achieved. Okay, so I'm just wondering how you applied 375 instead of 323. 
Well, we looked at we looked at uh, the building, uh, the size of what one uh, of the units that would uh, that would be leased out. Obviously, what they're achieving is uh, <coughs> on average somewhat lower than the 375 per square foot. But when we look at the uh, the unit sizes. Um, <coughs> And uh, keeping in mind the overall market value, uh, we felt that uh, a lift to the rent that they were achieving was appropriate, so we've applied 375. Uh, I have no further questions. Okay, Brent. Yeah, I have no questions. Any questions? I have no questions. Okay, and I have none, so you can proceed then with the evaluation. Okay, uh, so maybe we'll just start on page two of the brief then. Um, the subject was last sold February 6, 2013 for $1.36 million. Uh, and I, on pages uh, 15 and 16, I have the rent roll uh, from 2016, since we don't have the 2017. So there you can see uh, their, the total income on page 15 is uh, 235925 that they're bringing in. Uh, they're also reporting 45,000 square feet there, so I'm not sure where that discrepancy comes from. Um, we're, we're, uh, we have a leasable area of 36,250. Uh, on the next page, page 3, my comparable, so you'll see that all leases are current in relation to the reference date. Uh, all comparables are storage warehouses. Uh, effective dates range from 1948 to 1976. Wall heights range from 12 feet to 19 feet. The leasable areas range from approximately 800 square feet to 8,000 square feet. And the net rents range from $4.50 to $6.67. On the next page, our income lookup. Uh, we're utilizing a, a, the low average income quality market rent with an overall market rent of $5.14. Uh, we are in agreement with the vacancy, so we're applying 6% vacancy. We're allowing for 2% non-recoverables, and we're allowing $3.75 for vacancy shortfall. Uh, that gives us an NOI of 152945 we're using our highest uh, capital capital raising capital rate. Sorry, I can't speak right now. Uh, cap rate, so uh, at 9.8 percent. Uh, so that gives us a cap value of 1.560 uh, million. We're uh, estimating the value. We're assessing the value at 1,561,000. So if we go to page eight, we'll see the map, uh, and uh, the applicant has already uh, shown the map. Uh, so on page 9, uh, we see overhead view of the property. Uh, I was last there August 2018. Uh, I had to go check a premise. Uh, on the bottom is the street view, and then on the page 10 is an uh, alternate street view also. So taking into consideration the most recent sale, which was five years prior to the reference date in the amount of $1.36 million, uh, and the income that the property generates, we believe the assessed value of $1.561 million to be fair and equitable, and we respectfully ask that the board confirm that. Okay, questions, Mr. Uh Yes, looking at your rental comparables for the subject property, um, <coughs> We have uh, 1963, 76, 72, uh, plus uh, these are generally newer properties than the subject for the majority of it was constructed uh, well before those times were described. We have at least four, five, uh, between, uh, between 56 and 61. Right. So you're looking at effective Actually, year we, have, we have more than that. So what would their original dates of construction have been? I, I don't have that info. Okay. The locations, so we're looking at uh, Notre Dame, Logan, Ellis, Aaron, uh, Pacific. These are all properties that would have uh, 
Uh, would generate the same type of income, yes? That, that, I have not finished my question. These are all uh, relatively <coughs> relatively <coughs> uh, developed uh, industrial areas with better profile, better properties, more traffic flow, et cetera, correct? Correct, but we're uh, assigning a 9.8 cap rate for, for the we, subject property yes, to take into at what consideration location. Would. We're looking at what the property would rent for at the moment. So would you characterize this property backing onto the CPR tracks next to uh, the bridge over that uh, with gravel frontage, et cetera? Well, it's a residential industrial no, area industrial as, property. as comparable to the, question the Notre Dame, Ellis, et cetera. Would the zoning be the same? Uh, the zoning is the same, yes. These are all M3 properties. Oh, sorry, uh, they might not be, sorry. Uh, but M3 allows for heavy manufacturing, so that is the type of zoning that the uh, uh, subject property is located in. Right. My question was with regard to whether these other properties would be a different zoning. I'm, I I don't have that info in front of me, so okay. I can't answer that. The uh, sale of the property that you had, uh, had mentioned in uh, 2013, mm -hmm. was there any interview done with uh, the purchaser, etc.? No, I didn't do okay. any Those are all of my questions. Thank you. Okay, Laurie, any questions? I have no questions. Thank you. Brent? I have no questions. Thanks. And I have no questions, so thank you for that. Very brief summation uh, with regard to sale price. The subject property owner is uh, is uh, uh, immigrants to Canada. He's begun investing in uh, real estate. He's not really not summary. Down. That's new evidence. Fine. It is what it is. That's that is the background with regard to the sale. Okay. Thank you. Uh, three or one little street, and we'll get to your property before the end. <laughs> before. I'm fine. Yeah. Uh, three or one little street. Okay. Uh, Board of Revision, file number 19 1595. Uh, number. Okay, and then there's, again, there's a non co op yeah. on this. So after giving us the tools, the. Uh, the uh, the file number is just going to the uh, not all. Okay. Uh, so, Board of Revision file number 19-1595, which is 301 Lulu Street. Uh, we're asking for the burden of proof be placed on the applicant for no co-op. Uh, and if there is a reduction assessment, that it cannot be done for uh, one year. Uh, if you look on page two, uh, uh, there has been no... Uh, Income expense mailers uh, submitted since 2015. And on page 11, we have the registered mail that we sent out. And the envelope is on page 14. Any questions? I have no contention. No contention? All right. I was going to ask if the 2017 sale were so it's the same owner as present. Oh. oh. The time frame is such that uh, they would receive the 2018. Yeah. Okay. All right. I guess we don't have to discuss this on that. So you can proceed, Mr. Smith. Okay. 301 Lulu Street. Uh, property uh, <coughs> did transact in 2017, in January of 2017, for a uh, <coughs> value of $995,000. Um, as we go through the valuation, you'll see that uh, my valuation is different than that. The market evidence is such that uh, the property uh, as of valuation date and probably as of the purchase date as well, uh, we believe the property, uh, the market evidence does not necessarily support that uh, transaction price. However, if the board views that differently and feels that the uh, 
the sale price is appropriate, I would certainly uh, understand that uh, as well. However, as you can see, the, the sale price is significantly different from the valuation of the city at one million four hundred seven thousand. Let's look at uh, the property itself. Page number one was built in 1987, uh, zoned M2, uh, site area of just over 16,000 square feet, 11,558 square feet of rentable, leaseable area. The land to plan area ratio is very small on this site at 1.42 to one. Um, office area for the subject property is relatively uh, small at about 1,000 square feet. Um, and is pretty standard in terms of its build out. The remainder of the building is uh, is very straightforward in terms of uh, the uh, construction. It's a uh, steel frame, aluminum panel, exterior, uh, etc. You can see the pictures of this beginning on page number two with regard to the exterior, interior, and uh, the warehouse area at the rear of the property. Site is shown on page number six, obviously very minimal on-site uh, area for both parking and loading uh, as well. The <coughs> uh, photograph of the exterior is also shown on the front for you to review. This property again is located in a similar area to the last one. Uh, it is uh, in between Henry and uh, Higgins Avenue with a street name on Lulu. So it's essentially up against that uh, CPR tracks area as well in that, <coughs> that uh, West End area. Let's look at the valuation for the subject property. It is owner occupied. So what we've done in order to arrive at a fair market rent for the property is canvas the market, look for appropriate, uh, <coughs> appropriate lease uh, comparables and uh, present those to you in the chart as you can see. These vary in terms of uh, <coughs> location. Obviously, we're not going to find a lot of properties built in 1987 in this uh, particular area. Uh, we're not relying simply on age, but we're looking for size, uh, utility, ceiling height, uh, all, of the, all of the typical comparable issues that drive rental rate for industrial properties. If you look at the cost shown, we have 14. The majority of these are in established industrial parks and would be in considerably better areas than the subject property. Our areas range between uh, 8,000 up to 15 plus thousand square feet. We try to keep them in as close as possible to the area of the subject at 11,000. You can see that they frame those ages. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of newer properties in here as well. Um, I would point to uh, a couple of them, I suppose. We have a brand new. Uh, Flex Warehouse property on 400 Fort White Way in southwest Winnipeg, just west of Costco. Uh, premier location, they achieved a $7 rental rate for a very similar sized property there. This is a vastly superior property. We would expect a rent the rental rate to be below the $7 a square foot that they're achieving there. The rest of our comps, as you can see, uh, point towards uh, a rental rate of $6 a square foot. We've used $6 in our valuation for the subject property. Vacancy, uh, the statistics are shown from the Johnson report at the top of page 11. Uh, they certainly support a vacancy rate of 6%, which we have used in our valuation. Expense allowance includes the 5% non-recoverable as well as the 2% structural allowance in addition to the shortfall allowance of $3.75 a square foot. I would, of course, emphasize that each of these briefs uh, contains supportive uh, decisions from the 2020 cycle with regard to this issue. And I have many more that I have not included. They just continue to come in, but we have not uh, included all of them, obviously. Capitalization rate. Page number 13, uh, you can see that we have uh, included information from two of the main commercial brokerages in the city of Winnipeg. 
they are stating investment grade industrial assets. Uh, their view of that particular market is such that the cap rates would be between six and a half and seven and a quarter percent for colliers before adjustment for closing costs, etc. And CB Richard Bell is pointing to six percent to seven and a quarter percent. This is for investment grade properties. The subject property uh, would not fall within that range. Typically, we have a single tenant property in uh, a very non-standard, not, uh, not your typical investment grade location uh, where the subject property is located. However, it is relatively recent. It's in good condition. We've used the top end of the range at seven and a quarter percent. Our cap rate comparables are presented at the top of page number 13. And uh, as mentioned by an earlier appellant, we're not including the specific addresses for privacy reasons uh, with respect to uh, our, uh, our clientele. As you can see, these were all investment grade transactions and we're in that seven plus percent uh, range with regard to capitalization rate. Each of these would, uh, would be considered uh, superior likely to the subject property. Um, Looking at all of the factors, uh, we felt that seven and a quarter percent cap rate would be appropriate for the subject. So this gives us our final market value of eight hundred thousand dollars. Now, this valuation obviously is based on the market data uh, that uh, we have included here. I do recognize that the property transacted in twenty seventeen for a higher value. Um, uh, so what, uh, what we have done is based on the market evidence, uh, the sale price is there for you to see. I certainly understand if there's a, a different viewpoint from the panel members with regard to that. And I'm open for questions. Okay, questions? Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Okay, Brent, questions? I have no questions. I have no questions. Was the cap rate worked out for the based on the sale price? Do you know? For, for this property? property? Uh, there would be no cap rate because it's owner occupied. Oh, no, okay, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Just a brain fart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can proceed. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll just start on uh, page two uh, of my brief. So, yes, uh, there was a sale for 995000 on January 12, 2017, uh, page three, and, and I, I don't know if that was a lease back or not, we didn't have a, a sales manual provided. Uh, so on page three, I have my comparables. Um, you can see all leases are current in relation to the reference date. All comparables are storage warehouses. Effective dates range from 1972 to 1992. Wall heights range from 16 feet to 24 feet. Uh, leasable areas range from 8,000, 8,000 square feet to 15,000 square feet. The net rents range from $8 square feet to $10.68 per square feet. All comparables are zone M2 general manufacturing. So on page four is our workup. So we've, we've utilized the overall rate of $9.76 per square foot. Um, we're, we're allowing for a vacancy of 6%. We're allowing uh, non-recoverable expenses of 2%, allowing a vacancy shortfall at $3.75 per square foot. That gives us an NOI of $101,316. Uh, we have a cap rate of 7.2%, meaning it's in average condition. Uh, that gives us the capitalized value of $1,400,000. $407,167 for an assessed value of $1,407,000. Oh, uh, On page 8, I have a picture of the, uh, or oh, sorry, I have a map of the subject property. Uh, underneath is the subject uh, parcel boundaries. And then on page 9, we have a couple of overhead views. And page 10, we have some uh, street views. Uh, and I believe those are from Google Maps in 2014, so condition looks average. Uh, so just in conclusion, um, uh, according to the comps and our market data, we believe that the uh, 
assessed value of 1.407 million to be uh, fair and uh, equitable. Uh, however, uh, I see that the sale is there. Um, so we're open to uh, recommending that value of 995,000 since it was only one year prior to the reference date. Okay, question. Um, I, I think in fairness, if the, if the city is uh, uh, able to recommend the sale price of the property at 995, then I would be in agreement with, uh, with that valuation. Okay, there's it. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. All right. So it's, we'll accept that as a recommendation. Uh, 100 Phillips, I believe the contested information has been removed from the uh, material. So that's uh, incorrect one. Mm -hmm. All right, so you can proceed. Okay, uh, board of revision file number 19-631. Rule number is 13062195300. The address is 100 McPhillips Street. Rule year is 2020. Reference date is April 1st, 2018. We're assessing value at $1,932,000. Uh, parcel use code is industrial warehouse. Uh, number of buildings is two. The number of premises is one. Number of stories is one. The actual year built is 1949 to 1971. Uh, the effective year built is 1969. The wall height is between 20 feet and 24 feet. It's in the zoning uh, M3, manufacturing heavy. The land area is 72,805 square feet. That's about approximately 1.67 acres. The plan area is 32,720 square feet. Uh, same with the gross floor area, 32,720 square feet. Leasable area is 32,682 square feet. The land to plan area is 2.23 to 1. Uh, the following page, we see there was a sale uh, back in January 2000, uh, uh, 27, 2004 for 550000 Um Turn to page 11, uh, I have the income expense uh, mailer, and we see that the subject is owner occupied. Turning to page 3, there's my comparables, uh, so all the leases are current in relation to the reference date. The effective ages range from 1973 to 1990, wall heights range from 20 feet to 26 feet. Uh, leasable areas range from approximately 26,500 square feet to 37,000 square feet. Uh, net rents range from $4.50 per square feet to $6.50 per square feet. Uh, all uh, comparables are zone M. Uh, manufacturing general. Uh, if you turn to page four, here's our workup. Uh, so we're utilizing a below average market rental rate of $5.57 per square feet. Uh, we're allowing 6% uh, vacancy loss. We're uh, allowing for 2% non-recoverable expenses. We're allowing a vacancy shortfall of $3.75 per square feet. That gives us an NOI of $160,342. We're using a, our high cap rate of 8.3%, which gives us a capitalized value of 1.931 million, almost 1.932 million, and that's what we're assessing it at, at 1.932 million dollars. So on page eight is the uh, map and the subject parcel boundaries. On page 9 is the overhead view. It's located right on the corner of McDermott and Phillips Street. Um, and at the bottom is another overhead view. 
page 10 is a view at the top, a view from the Phillips Street, and the bottom picture is a view from McDermott Avenue. So taking into consideration the below average market rental rates that we've used in calculating our uh, uh, assessed value, we believe that the uh, assessed value is fair and equitable, and I, I respectfully ask that the board confirm that value. Any questions, Ms. Christian? Um, <clears throat> just uh, given uh, given workload, have you been able to inspect this particular? Uh, I have gone there before, not at, for this uh, pre, uh, this assessment, but I've been there as a FA. Okay, so you've been in the project. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I haven't been inside. I went to uh, inspect, but I couldn't get in. So. Oh, okay. So you've seen the exterior. Uh, yes, that's fair. Um, the <coughs> the uh, construction of the property, uh, the 49 to 71, roughly two thirds of it would have been built in 49, correct? Um, I'm not sure, but we're giving an effective year of 1969. Okay, so if I were to, um, again, I know that it's hard to have all the information all the time. I went and looked at the property attributes online for it, and a little over 20,000 was built in 49, and a little over 12,000 was built in 71. So I'm just wondering why the net effective, or rather the, the effective year built would be two years prior to the newest construction when the majority of the building was built in 49. Uh, like I said, I don't have that info. Okay. Uh, we're giving it a high tax rate. Yeah. That's fair. In, uh, <clears throat> in looking at the comparables on uh, page number three, uh, the, the years stated here would all be <coughs> would all be uh, significantly newer, correct? Correct, yes. And uh, they'd all be in established industrial parks such as uh, Easter Park, Church, Church, Paramount, Keewayton. I see Higgins and Jarvis that are outside of it. But mm -hmm. for the most part, they're in Inkster, is that fair? Uh, it, it, yes, they are. It's just finding uh, properties with this size of leasable area. It's pretty hard. It is a challenge. I, I certainly uh, agree with you there. Um, the uh, those, I believe, sorry, let me just have a quick peek here. Yeah, those are all my questions. Thank you. Okay, Brent, questions? I have no questions. I have no questions. Okay, thank you. You can proceed then. Okay, so what I'll do to start with is uh, take you to the addenda materials. If you look at the page immediately after the income and expense uh, submission, and I'm afraid I don't get to number all of my addenda materials, so it's difficult to do. I'll hold it up. It's the order revision order from 2018, right after the income and expense. So this is the 2018 time frame. Property was uh, under appeal then and uh, was decided based on the applicant's evidence, which was myself. I presented that evidence on the following page, which was utilizing a rental rate of $4.25 a square foot and a cap rate of 8.5% for the subject property at that time frame. So that is the background for the subject. Moving forward, we have uh, a <clears throat> picture on the front of the property from uh, McPhillips itself, just so you can recognize it. You've probably all seen it going down there. Moving into page number one, from 2018 to 2020, we're looking at an increase of 43.6% uh, in assessed value for the subject property. Again, we do not see this taking place on the marketplace for a property that has had no changes to it in that in that span of time. Nothing has happened to it. It's still the same property. In fact, the owner <coughs> uh, who was was in the property, they still remain in it to some extent, bought another property because property no longer suited their needs and they've moved uh, elsewhere, but he still retains this property at the, this particular point, although they're intending to get out of it. Um, the 
<coughs> data is there for you. Uh, the age of the property is shown. This is uh, zoned M3 heavy manufacturing. <coughs> a our, uh, a metal <coughs> metal fabrication shop, uh, essentially on the inside. And you'll see that in the photos. Original property was built in 1940. 49, 20,400 square feet, 1971 addition, 12,320 square feet. So two thirds of the building is from 1949 uh, and is indicative of such. Uh, our site area is 1.7 acres, so we have a relatively low land to plan area ratio of 2.23 to 1. This limits your on site storage uh, and access to. Uh, <coughs> to loading, et cetera, and makes, uh, makes that a challenge. Uh, obviously not uh, in the ideal range of four plus typically. Moving on to the photos, you can see the photos of the property beginning on page two. There is a small office area at the front as shown. And we can get into the interior on page number four. Um, original structures obviously uh, Wood, <clears throat> wood frame, post and beam, wood, uh, wood deck, uh, roof, which they have had issues with over time, and uh, relatively heavy use, so you can see obviously the wear and tear and condition of the property on the inside. Um, so the task, of course, is what would this rent for on the marketplace uh, in the condition that it is, uh, in the location that it is, with all of its various attributes. So. Let's look at that. The shite is shown on page six, fronting on McPhillips at the corner of McDermott, and the location on page number seven. So it is, uh, it's in an older industrial area, certainly, um, certainly off center in terms of uh, the main industrial parts. Uh, and uh, the supportive uses and, uh, and loading, et cetera, that one typically achieves in those locations as well as transport routes, uh, et cetera. So that is where the property is. We can move on to the valuation itself. Again, keep in mind this is an M3 property, so not all M2 uses would be uh, permitted within this particular property. Page number 10, we have a market, or rather an owner-occupied property, so we need to look to the market for an appropriate rental rate. And as noted, uh, it can be difficult to have properties that are the exact same size uh, for comparison. So what we've done is give you uh, our best information with regard to leases on the marketplace uh, in order to frame an appropriate rental rate for the subject property. These are all typically better located in uh, more recent properties, uh, 1245 border, uh, in that uh, St. James industrial area, we have Fife and Inkster. Oman's Creek is a much newer building, uh, significantly superior, I would suggest. 225 McPhillips uh, is an older property, 1952, so of the same vintage as the original part of this building. $3.84 a square foot for 32,000 square feet, lower wall height at 16 feet and uh, greater area as well as the lease was done in 2013, but that was the closest information that we had. And we have Inkster, Century, Mission, etc. Our rents obviously range uh, from four, well, a low of $3.84 a square foot, which is an older lease, um, up to $5.34 a square foot for a superior building on Century. Um, you can see uh, the various wall heights and dates of construction here. <coughs> I would uh, suggest that looking at uh, your properties on uh, Omans and Fife, certainly the subject would be inferior to those in terms of uh, <coughs> in terms of uh, rental applicability. They we have one. One at 15 plus thousand square feet, one at 45,000. The subject is 32. Um, we have 777 Century, 2017 lease, 40,000 square feet uh, at uh, 534 a square foot. Again, superior to the subject. Uh, we felt that $4.75 a square foot, given the 
location, condition, build out of the subject would be appropriate for the subject. Our vacancy rate applied is 6%, as well as the 5 and 2%, and the shortfall allowance of $3.75 a square foot. The actual operating expenses for the building in 2017 were $8.71 a square foot. We are not asking for any increase. We're simply using the $3.75 a square foot for the subject. The cap rate, uh, we've used 8.25% for the subject. Uh, it's described here. We've given the same information. It's an older property. Uh, wood frame has some structural issues, some deferred maintenance, significant wear and tear um, in a non-standard uh, location. Uh, zoned M3, which restricts your use. Eight and a quarter is, uh, is more than appropriate, uh, and it is a decrease from our valuation in the last cycle as well at 8.5%. So we have increased our rental rate and decreased our capitalization rate from the prior cycle to arrive at our market value of $1,556,000. And I'm open for questions. Any questions? Uh, no. Question, Laurie? I have none. Thank you. Thank you. I have none. Thank you very much. And we will come to 55 more don't. Not more door, but more don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, can I get to use a Lord of the Rings reference? Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, you can proceed. Okay, uh, Board of Revision, file number 19 1600, roll number 1309155500, more balance. Uh, roll year is 2020, reference date is April 1st, 2018, assessed value is 586000 it is industrial warehouse parcel use. Uh, number of buildings is one. Number of premises is one. It's one story built in 1984. Effective year is 1984. Wall height is 18 feet. Zoning is M2 general manufacturing. The land area is 23,615 square feet. Plan area is 11,520 square feet. Gross floor area is 11,520 square feet. Same with the leasable area, 11,520 square feet. Land to plan area is 2.05 to 1. Uh, on the following page, page 2, uh, we don't see any net uh, leases, but if you turn to page 12, or sorry, 11, there is the income and expense mailer. <clears throat> so uh, the property... The income expense manager says it's fully owner occupied, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, it's gross rent is what they're claiming, uh, and the income you see that they're generating is sixty-three thousand six hundred twenty-three dollars a year. On the following page, page twelve, we have the rent roll there. So uh, it looks like the they're using an average gross rental rate of five dollars and forty-one cents. Back to page three, uh, the, there are my comparables. So you can see that all leases are current in relation to the reference date. Uh, effective ages range from 1966 to 1994. Wall heights range from 12 feet to 28 feet. Leasable areas range from approximately 10,500 square feet to 15,000 square feet. And the net rents range from $2.19 to $5.50. Uh, turning to page four, so we're using uh, our, in in our income workup, we're using a below average overall rent net market rent of $4.22 per square feet. We're allowing for a 6% vacancy rate, we're allowing 2% non recoverable expenses, we're allowing a vacancy shortfall of $3.75 per square feet. That gives us an NOI of $42,191. 
We're utilizing a cap rate of 7.2%. That gives us a capitalized value of $585,986,000, and therefore we're assessing the uh, property at $586,000. Uh, so if you turn to page 8, there's the map of the subject area. Uh, below that is the subject parcel boundaries. On page 9, there is uh, two overhead views of the subject. And then on page 9, there's some street views. Oh, sorry, on page 10, there's some street views of the property. So, in conclusion, so we believe our assessed value of $586,000 to be fair and equitable, and I respectfully ask that the board confirm that value. Okay, I hear questions. <clears throat> Just uh, a couple, I guess. Um, in looking at the, the rent house on page three, so um, Dufferin, Hutchings, Eagle, Mission. These are all uh, <clears throat> these are all established uh, uh, industrial parks, correct? Uh, well, Mission is of the older section of St. Boniface right. Industrial. Okay. okay. Um, would they, uh, and I hesitate to ask the question because I know the difficulty in obtaining information, but is, were there leases in the subject area in that uh, Punk Douglas? Uh, and I know the challenge. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, I probably looked. Or most likely look, uh, I'm not sure though what. Okay. Uh, Dufferin would probably be the lo closest in uh, location, would that be correct? Uh, Dufferin and then I believe Mission is on the other side there. Uh, in uh, in St. Boniface. Right. Yes. Right. Um, and the rents that you're showing on great sorry, on uh, page 12, those are the, the gross rental rates as stated, correct? For the subject? Sorry? Uh, those are the gross the, rents on, that are On the income expense, yes. Right, okay. Um, so just uh, to submit it into evidence, I don't want to speak to it. I have rebuttal with regard to the 5% non-recoverable. I don't want to go over it, but I do need to submit it so that it's in evidence for the, for mm -hmm. the property, if we can just distribute that. Sure. I think we've all. Do you want to just give me a copy of the panel? Or? Uh, how many do you need? Well, otherwise you can give these to the panel or? members. Sure. It's up to you if you want to. I'll, I'll hand it out mm -hmm. just so it's. Uh, sure, it doesn't seem need five, right? Yes. There you go. We've all heard a lot about this. I'm not going to go into it in any greater detail. It was covered very thoroughly at the beginning. Ah! By the other appellant, and I've delved into it a bit, a bit as well. This is simply background information for the panel, and I will not speak to it any further. Okay. <coughs> Same presentation? Uh, those were my questions, I think. I don't oh, questions. Yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. But, uh, those <laughs> are all my questions, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, question, Brent? I have no questions. Sorry. Okay, uh, you can proceed with your presentation. All right, 55 more dots. I will take you to, it, it is not owner-occupied. There are four tenants in place for the subject. Um, take you to page number six and seven. <clears throat> so page number six gives you the site aerial. That's the boundaries of the property outlined in red. Very, uh, very minimal land to plan area ratio at uh, just over 2%. Uh, it's essentially uh, some uh, a little bit of parking for each tenant uh, and a very small side yard area. The location, more importantly, and I wish this was zoomed in a bit closer to uh, the location of it, it is in that uh, Point Douglas area. And as you can see from the site description on page number six, it abuts the CPR line uh, to the north. And if you follow Higgins uh, around, Higgins is 
roughly half a street over to the east, uh, where you go under the CPR tracks and then over the bridge into the uh, Elmwood area. So that's the location that we're looking at, right in the heart of of uh, Point Douglas area. The subject property itself was built in 1984, has a leasable area of 11,520 square feet, zoned M2. And uh, again, the low land to plan area ratio of 2.01 to 1. 2.0 to 1, rather. The property is shown beginning on page 2 in photographs. The side yard is shown at the bottom of page 2. It's gravel surface. Uh, it's a butler building, essentially steel frame, exterior panel, aluminum panel, etc. You're looking at uh, relatively small uh, tenancies here that uh, are not able to afford uh, better locations. I realize the property was built in 84. However, it is located where it is, and the rents that they're able to achieve are what they're able to achieve on the marketplace. We have a couple of auto, uh, <coughs> auto places uh, that are located here. Uh, one film, uh, uh, film industry uh, company that supplies props and needs a place to store them. And then uh, the third one, I forget what they're particular, I think they were auto-related as well. Um, so you can see the interiors of the units here, pretty straightforward. Uh, cement floors, uh, demised, you've got unit hung heaters, etc. They're not overly large. Ceiling height is fairly, or rather, exterior height is fairly typical at 18 feet. Uh, nothing elaborate or out of the ordinary as far as the properties. The location is critical to uh, the valuation here and drives what they are able to achieve in rent. So let's look at <clears throat> the rental comparables that we have. And again, these, we included as many as we can from the subject area. Uh, these are properties that I represented. So we have uh, some rents at 68 Higgins. Uh, this is obviously an older property. Um, <clears throat> but uh, they operate on a gross basis as well. They're generating rents in that 291, 286, 356 range all month to month. And we have uh, 10 Higgins where they were generating just under $2 a square foot in 2016. We then have some asking rents in the immediate area, Higgins, Jarvis, King, Logan, etc. They range from 272 to 350 a square foot. Uh, you can see the age range of those properties. Again, location is critical driver of rent in this area. Uh, the actual rents for the subject property are shown above that on page 10. It is operated on a gross basis. And you can see the gross rents there sick from a low of $3.12 up to $6.09 a square foot. Deducting the operating costs, you come to the net rental rates of around $2.50 a square foot with one of them obviously falling uh, below that. Now, can we value the property on the basis of getting a, a negative rent? No, we can't, so we're not, we're not doing that. Uh, we're looking at the market for comparable rents and uh, what we have applied to the subject property based on age, location, uh, size, build out, uh, amenities, etc., uh, loading, uh, wall height is a rental rate of $3.75 a square foot. You can see that's well above what they're receiving. And uh, indeed, above what uh, we're showing in the immediate area for, uh, in some cases, buildings that uh, might be uh, somewhat inferior to the subject. So we've applied 375 to our analysis. The expense side includes vacancy of 6%, the 5 and 2% non recoverable allowances, as well as shortfall of $3.75 a square foot. And Coming to capitalization rate, uh, we have the same information presented. The subject property, while new, er, built in 1984, is located in Point Douglas area. Um, the rents that they're achieving 
are indicative of a lower grade investment quality property when we're getting below three dollars a square foot for relatively small units or indeed not not even covering costs on the one uh, I think that gives you an indication of uh, the quality of the income stream and uh, the tenancies um, so that needs to be taken into account uh, looking at the cap rates uh, that we have obviously seven plus percent for true investment grade properties uh, both multi and single tenants uh, generally larger than the subject obviously these are indicative of uh, <coughs> what investors would pay for good quality properties on the market the subject would fall well below that uh, the ranges given by colliers and cbre are up to seven and a quarter percent this would be well beyond that, uh, and we've used a cap rate of 8.5% in our analysis. Um, again, uh, location is critical in valuing these things, and given uh, the location of the subject property, you're not going to drive high cap rate, whether it was built in 84 or 1950. So our final market value is $414,000. And I think our agenda remained the same uh, with regard to the supportive decisions on the non-recoverable issue. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, just one. Uh, in regards to your cap rate uh, on page 14, mm -hmm. so your evidence, you have uh, five properties. They're all below 7.5% cap. There's one at 8.3 on Waverly, which is a built-up uh, neighborhood. Uh, where did you get the 8.5% cap from? Well, we discussed that, uh, obviously. Uh, looking at <coughs> the subject property, we're looking at a location in Point Douglas, uh, abutting the CPR line, uh, gravel surface street, low-grade uh, tenancies within it, very marginal uh, revenue stream. So the the uh, viability of the, the tenants uh, uh, ongoing is an issue, so your, your quality of the income stream is, is questionable. Um, all of these are significantly better properties than the subject with regard to location uh, and uh, the tenants that are in place as well. And it's a property that is going to uh, not draw a, uh, a low cap rate. In the investment so did you have any after. sales in that area? No, I show didn't. The I'm afraid I did not. No, okay. Those are all the questions. Can you learn questions? I have no questions. Brent? Just one question. Mm -hmm. Is the parking lot in gravel? I'm looking at page five. Page uh, five. It is indeed gravel, yes. It is. Some of that, in fact, is uh, the roadway. Um, so the top of uh, top of page five is the laneway uh, that abuts uh, the CPR line. If you look at page number six, so the top of page five is the top of page six, and the bottom of page five would be the western side. So that would be the Mordaunt Street uh, frontage. I believe. Okay, that was my only question. Okay, thank you, Trevor. That concludes your portion. And then we will come back to a very <laughs> uh, 252 Albert Street. So thank you for your patience, everyone. Thank you. All the material to Trevor. Did you want to do the five minute break before I? No, I think we got we got to, They need this room for one o'clock, and we have to make our decisions and all that kind of stuff. So. Am I still on for that hearing this afternoon? I believe so. Okay. lunch. <laughs> I brought it this time. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say your full name, please? Stephen J. Kinesh. He said that the evidence was to get the to the truth, but they to the the Okay. Thank you. Take a seat, please.
All right. I understand there's a non-poll. Good morning, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for sharing your time with me. I won't be as elaborate as my predecessor. Okay. We'll just let the assessor put the evidence in first. Good afternoon. Thank you. So this is Board of the Revision File Number 19-929, Rule Numbers 13060893000, and the address is 52 Albert. Now, there was a, we were requesting a burden of proof be placed on the applicant for non-co-op, but you've just purchased the building recently, so we don't feel that the previous owner's actions or inactions should be, you know, you should be penalized for those, so we're not going to ask for the non-co-op. And we're also recommending, I had a chance to read your brief, and we're willing to assess the building at the purchase price, even though there was, I don't know why there was purchase, a sale back in 2015 of $1.25 million, but you purchased the building recently for $885,000? Correct. Yeah, so we're willing to just go to that value. Okay, I accept that response. Just to give you some background in two minutes, the building has been under disrepair since the previous owners. There were functioning businesses at that time. There was water damage, so walls were damaged, piping, flooring has been damaged and removed by the previous owner, so essentially the building is a shell. Brick walls and floor joists are essentially what is there, so there's absolutely no opportunity for revenue because there's no heat, there's no electricity in the building other than the primary in the basement. So anyway, that's just to give you a sense of where the building is at in its current condition. Does the building on the Albert, the Royal Albert, does that affect your building? No. Because there's tenants in there that... Different conversation. The tenants affect the community, yes. Sometimes, I heard that sometimes they leave the water off and the pipes burst, and does that affect your building? No, it's separate. Okay, which one is this? I'm just looking at the city's pictures. Is this next? It's the one right beside the Royal Albert Arms. That time you meet with? I know. It's 52 Albert. It's got a range of addresses, but it's identified as 52. It's on the north side of the Albert, touching the Albert, and then that little chip stand is a different property owner. Okay, all right. Thank you. I just wanted to place it. Okay. So thank you for your presentations, and you waited patiently for a very short time. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay, that concludes today's hearing, so thank you very much. Thank you. Yep, seven minutes. Seven? Seven.